Hey guys welcome back. This is a story about what if Naruto went to the world of One Piece. Naruto's age has pet him by as his time is over. Now he attempts to seek out a place for himself in the new world, and it's bigger than he ever figured it to be. Will be epic in length. Before we start thank you for all of the support it really means a lot to me. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel and leave a like you can suggest a Naruto fanfiction with a link in the comments if you want me to read it. And check the description for the creator of this great fanfic and support them for making this fanfic. So let's start. Chapter 33. Round trip Nojiko stood at the helm directly behind Naruto watching his every move like a hawk. Don't be so tense Naruto-kun, I'm not mad. She said resting her hands on his shoulders, maging them gently before planting a on the back of his neck, it's not your fault. You were worried about us being turned to stone. How could you have been paying attention to the ship when you were focused on saving us? The good news is that I can get us further along our actual route in the Grand Line from where I take us on the comm belt. Naruto said, grateful that Nojiko or anyone else on the crew didn't hold any anger towards being knocked so far off course by the events of yesterday, the Horatian Kanai on One Finger Island is a really good status marker. I'll tell you when we get back on the comm belt so you can map out our trajectory to where we'll get back on at. Nojiko smiled and let go of Naruto, moving backwards off of him, sounds like a plan to me. There's a good spot for us to use as a marker for getting onto the comm belt. She moved in front of Naruto and showed him a map of the South Blue, right here, this place Centoria. Like I told you this morning we can use that as a good marker. It's the closest place to the comm belt so we can begin getting back on our route from there. On it Noji-chan, Naruto said as he already knew where to go. He had already been given coordinates and directions that morning and they had been en route for quite a while, we shouldn't take that long getting there. I've had the sails catching the breeze in this direction since last night basically. I actually feel really hungry because I'm using so much chakra. Nojiko rolled up the map and gave him a strange look, you're hungry. How could you be hungry? We just saw you inside not too long ago during breakfast. You absolutely defeated it. In return, Naruto just gave her a blank stare, um no. I've been out here all morning since the crack of dawn. I only got two hours of sleep last night and that was just so I could dry off from the rain. Tilting her head in confusion, Nojiko pointed back towards where the captain's quarters were situated, seriously, I saw you at breakfast. You ate and then you went to take a nap with Miss Valentine. When I saw you out here I just figured you stayed there until she fell asleep and then came back outside. Nojiko looked around in suspicion, this is really creepy. Naruto just stood there racking his brain for a solution before his eyes finally widened in realization prior to narrowing to slits. He set the wheel in place and grabbed a hold of Nojiko, come on, I think I know what happened. With that they disappeared in a flash of yellow and reappeared in Naruto's room at the foot of his bed to find another Naruto asleep with Miss Valentine holding onto him, eyeing knew it. Naruto hissed out in a whisper. The clone of Naruto cracked an eye before both Swao open in alarm at seeing its creator and Nojiko, one giving it an angry look, the other one extremely amused, hey boss, Noji-chan. What's up? The clone whispered, well aware of the sleeping Valentine wrapped around him. You ate my food. Naruto said in a low voice, the only reason I made you when I woke back up this morning was to leave a message for Polly. What do you think you're doing? Naruto's clone shrugged, not really caring about its fate at this point, I like to call it living the dream. The only response at first was a cracking of knuckles from the original Naruto, I wish I could do this more than once. He said before punching the clone hard enough to dispel it in a puff of smoke. Miss Valentine barely noticed the loss of the clone's presence and compensated by grabbing a pillow on the bed in place, man that looks comfortable though, he said in reference to sleeping in a bed with a pretty girl, before he could move to actually attempt to join her his stomach growled horribly, but I'm so hungry, and I can't go back to sleep yet, I've got work to do. Feeling compian when it came to all three of Naruto's current grievances, Nojiko merely grabbed him by his hand and led him out of the room to the common area, come on, let's see if we can find you some leftovers or something to actually eat, and maybe some coffee too. Coffee. Naruto said in a questioning voice as he blocked a yawn, what's coffee? Four hours later, Johnny and Yosaku leaned against the tree-like main mast, covered in scratches and scuffs and panting heavily, no more, Johnny said waving his hand out in front of him, 
that was just, I don't even know how to explain what just happened to us. He said before leaning his head back with a thud on the mast. Yosaku tried to stand up but just didn't feel like he had it in him to do so due to his lack of energy at the moment, I now know what it feels like to get my kicked in fast forward. In front of them, Naruto was swinging a very satisfied Samahata, full from draining Johnny and Yosaku's energy in battle, about in a grandiose samurai manner while in the background Nojiko, Bibi, Holly, and Soren stood watching him act out, like all of his manic quirks decided to just come out all at once. God that was violent. Holly said in reference to how Naruto had just handily dispatched both Johnny and Yosaku with Samahata, were they paying attention when they came out here to challenge him? I'm not getting near that guy until his buzz dies. He said, taking a puff from his cigar. Soren merely stared at the scene while ing on a tangerine from the tree outside. He then turned towards Nojiko who was hiding her face with her hands, you gave him coffee didn't you? His answer was a desperate from Nojiko that said she had, as if he needed it. Why do you think none of us ever turned him onto the stuff? I love coffee. Naruto shouted, holding Samahata over his head as it vibrated in agreement with its user, it's like a black, liquidy soldier pill. He then pointed Samahata at Bibi who took an involuntary step back, Bibi Heim get out here, it's your turn. Said princess simply shook her head no, it's time for your training though. He reasoned, resealing Samahata. Bibi laughed nervously as she continued to step backwards, I think I'll take the day off today. She then noticed him giving her a dry look, you're not giving me a choice are you? Naruto shook his head no, I didn't think you were. Bibi quickly pulled off her ranged jewelry belt weapon and sent the end of it out, stabbing into the mast to allow herself to escape up the side. Naruto growled and pointed up at the young woman, you're not getting away that easily. He prepared to run up the mast when he found a rope tied around his legs tripping him up and holding him back. He turned to see that Polly had caught him with one of his ropes and tied him to the railing, why wasn't I paying attention to that? Because you trust us. Polly explained to him before Fing his tensed rope, you can't break that rope with brute force, you just end up ripping the railing up before you broke the rope. Even cutting it would take a while. So just calm down until you get all of the caffeine out of your system. You're scaring more than a few of us. The caffeine was strong however. Naruto jerked against the rope several times before the urge to go into sage mode or even further than that to free himself had to be quelled before he did damage to his own ship. He took a series of deep breaths to calm himself down, okay I'm cool, everything's alright. You can come down now Bibi Heim. Hearing him say that, Bibi dropped to the ground but kept a good distance away from Naruto as she jumped back almost 10 feet when Naruto twitched intensely, Naruto you're scaring me. I think I'm scaring me too. Naruto replied honestly before he found himself dogpiled by a vengeful Johnny and Yosaku who began stomping away at a downed Naruto while they had their advantage over him, what the are you guys doing? Naruto asked over the blows raining down upon him. You've been kicking RS for the better part of a year. Johnny said as he stomped away, we are never going to get a chance like this to get you back ever again. Yosaku jumped into the air for three elbow drops on the immortal blonde while Johnny kept stomping. It's justifiable vengeance. Yosaku reasoned, relishing in getting Naruto back. Ow. Naruto shouted due to the attack on his person, you know I'm going to get you two back for this right. Ow. I'm going to get you both back so bad. Johnny and Yosaku stopped and looked at each other before looking back down at Naruto, we don't care. They both yelled simultaneously before dropping simultaneous jumping elbows on Naruto. The other crewmates just watched until Soren finished his tangerine and climbed up on the banister, about to jump off until Nojiko grabbed his pant leg, what the do you think you're doing? She asked the acid-spitting former bounty hunter. Soren pointed down at Naruto, how many other chances am I going to get to do this and get away with it? He asked. Naruto heard him over his beatdown and yelled up at him, you won't get away with it. That's not the point Uzumaki. Soren yelled down to him. He then turned back to Nojiko, tell me that one time of them getting him back isn't worth the last ton of months of him getting one over on them, and me. Nojiko thought of all of the times when Naruto increased their weights without warning, beat them up during training, times that he just threw seawater on Soren, and everything else, prompting her to let go of Soren's leg, thank you. He said calmly before pointing down at Naruto, sweet, sweet revenge. 
Soren cried out before diving off of the banister down onto Naruto with an elbow drop, Tekai elbow drop. Everyone else flinched when Soren hit the ground and Naruto with a solid thud. Naruto just lay there as Soren got up and the punishment ended. I'm going to get all three of you back for this. Naruto muttered as Soren spit acid on the rope keeping his ankles tied. You guys are so dead when I figure out what I'm going to do to get you back. He said crawling on the ground towards the helm to wait for the feeling to come back to his legs. Yosaku looked at Naruto crawling away, stopping at the stairs to the helm to turn and glare at all of them, making the hand sign that he's watching them, we're going to pay for that aren't we? Oh yes. Johnny replied, not really concerned in the least with what could happen to him in the near future, but tell me that it wasn't worth whatever he'll do to get us back. I don't know yet. Yosaku said honestly, picking his nose absently, I'll tell you after it happens. Later that evening, Centauria, on the shores of the island nation, a sentry posted as a lookout of sorts saw a strange orange ship based off of the design of the basic ship of the marines, so they sent scouts out here to prepare to counter the rebellion. One of the men with him as his partner let out a laugh, ha. Huh. I didn't know the marines were that stupid, don't they know it's too late for that. They can't save their precious world government's hold on this island, we've already gotten rid of their representatives. We should tell our commander, he'll want to make an example out of them. To not stand against the revolutionary army. With that declaration the men all chattered in agreement. On board the natural disaster. Naruto was still manning the helm only now he had Mura checking over the wounds that she had come outside to heal a few hours earlier after the caffeine incident, I swear I never get over how fast you heal Naruto-sama. You should still have a face covered in SC bads. I'm fine. Naruto insisted the ship's medic, you don't need to waste supplies on me Murat. I don't think I'll ever be so far gone that I'll need you to get yourself in gear to help me out or I'll die. The worry was nice, but he didn't need her all stressed out for nothing when he could get over most of his injuries in a day or two. Murat in return gave him a dry look and gave Naruto a few pats on his cheek, you gave me one million belly, up front, without even a second thought, and you still pay for things when I don't need you to. Like it or not you've pretty much got my loyalty for life. I'm a doctor to the entire crew, and I treat everyone equally, not selectively. She finished with a smile. So you say that you work for me? Naruto asked her, getting a cheerful nod in response, could I get you to drug Johnny, Yosaku, and Soren's food during the next meal? Nothing serious, I just need their awareness thrown off so I can get the drop on them, they beat the crap out of me. Murat gave Naruto a serious look, I'm not going to stick drugs in my patient's food Naruto-sama. Murat heard Naruto mutter, it, getting her to quirk upwards, I can just give you the drugs to do it yourself. That cheered Naruto back up, and that works for me. Uzumaki. Hearing the voice of one of the people he had intentions of getting revenge on yelling down from the lookout point at him, Naruto looked out over the waters to his side to see four ships heading from the coast they were pinged by, what's the plan? Soren asked from the crow's nest. Naruto grabbed a nearby pair of binoculars and looked at the ships. They didn't look like any kind of marine vessel nor were they flying any pirate colors. He didn't feel like fighting an unknown quantity today for no reason. Naruto simply sat at his bench at the helm and formed the ram seal to begin forming chakra, they can't fire at us unless they're broadside. We're just going to speed back up and hop on into the comm belt from here. We'll lose them that way. With that, a breeze started waving through the leaves of the tree-like mast and through the sails with the seals inscribed in them, speeding up the ship even further. The natural disaster simply tore right past the slow-moving ships making their way out from the coast, unable to get into range to turn their cannons towards the foxhound pirate ship. With the revolutionary army, the men on the ships attempting to pursue and engage the natural disaster were utterly stunned at the pure speed that the ship exhibited, that ship is so fast. The current isn't nearly strong enough to get that kind of speed, neither is the wind. We're right by the comm belt. That is one funky looking marine ship. The comments ran rampant on all four ships until one spotter pointed something out coming from the coast further down the island, look that's Dragon's ship. Right there. Yeah, Dragon. He'll stop those government dogs. On board the natural disaster, one more ship coming Uzumaki. Soren yelled down from the crow's nest as he saw a ship with a figurehead that appeared to be a dragon, it's going to cut us off, get ready for a fight. We're not fighting, Naruto said as he stood up and started making a long chain of hand seals, Sweden, 
Debakufu no Jutsu Water Release, Great Waterfall Jutsu. A MIV wave rose 50 feet in the air at the side of the natural disaster, surprising Murat who hadn't seen Naruto's powers up close before, not even at any's lobby. Wow, was all that the medic could say. Up in the crow's nest, Soren released a sweat drop and stared at the wave with a twitching eye, tell me again how this doesn't qualify as fighting. This is why. Naruto said as he directed the wave to crash down a distance away from the dragon figure-headed ship, making sure that all that occurred was the ship losing its momentum so that they didn't catch up with the natural disaster, and there you go. No fighting necessary. That was impressive. An unfamiliar voice said on board the ship, getting Naruto to turn around and stand in front of Murat protectively as she held her hand on Funkfree just in case, I don't think you caused an earthquake the way Whitebeard would have to do that, because his would have been bigger. You manipulated the water itself. Most devil fruit powers can't do that. Naruto narrowed his eyes at the strange man on his ship leaning against the banister nearby with a sinister grin on his face, I wasn't trying to hurt anyone. I just want to get to the calm belt. Naruto explained calmly. The man wore a long green cloak and had spiky black hair with a widow's peak of sorts. He had stubble on his face, no eyebrows, and a set of red tribal markings on the left side of his face, who are you? He didn't even bother asking how he got there. Naruto could have done the same thing to any of the other ships himself. Well, that depends. The man said, his grin never dropping, most people call me, the world's most dangerous criminal, but you don't look like a marine. My men should have been paying attention to the fact that you fly a Jolly Roger. He then pointed to himself, in that case you can call me Dragon. Nurit paled and took a step back her hands shaking as she drew Funkfreed from the sheath, what do you want with us? Dragon merely laughed and stepped off of the banister, taking a step forward, I didn't want anything other than to meet the new bane of the world government. You're quite an infamous man Uzumaki Naruto. You don't look much like a butcher that delights in defeating marines though. The silence emanating from Naruto started scaring Murat as she thought Naruto was intimidated, I've never seen Naruto-sama hesitate to speak to anyone before. Is he frightened? Naruto finally spoke up, a chuckle in his voice, I was thinking of something witty to say, but I just can't think of anything. All I can think about is how much I want to fight a guy like you to see how strong I really am. That probably sounds really weird doesn't it? Are you really that insane? Murat and Soren both thought to themselves hearing Naruto pretty much challenging the most dangerous man in the world to a fight. Soren wondered where on earth all of the others were. Was Dragon really able to get on board without alerting anyone to his presence? He only knew Naruto as someone that would have been able to pull that off. Actually yeah, Dragon said, sounding amused at Naruto's confession, it does sound very weird that you would want to fight me. First no marine vice admirals that don't want to fight me, and they actually have a reason to. He let out a laugh, but I can't fight you, mostly because we'd probably destroy your nice ship in the process and maybe hurt your nakama. He said, nodding his head towards Murat who was still pretty scared, and I still have a lot of work to do. The world government isn't going to overthrow itself. Naruto blinked as he thought about who Dragon was, that's why you're so famous, because you're taking control away from the world government. Dragon nodded, yes. We've just now gotten Centauria free of their control. It took two years of fighting to do. A frown came onto Naruto's face, so you start insurrections and make wars happen. The blonde shinobi shook his head, I don't agree with that. He saw the grin drop from Dragon's face, if you keep pushing like that then the world government is going to push back hard. I just saw them take out an entire island filled with their own agents and marines just to defeat my crew and Straw Hat Luffy's crew. What would they do when you start knocking on their front door the way we did? The two stared each other down for a moment before Dragon's grin came back, so you know my boy Luffy. I like that. He needs a friend like you out in the world. He then saw Murat and Naruto's eyes widen. Ooh, I wasn't supposed to say that out loud. Could you just keep that a secret? He saw Naruto and Murat both nod slowly, thanks. No problem. They both responded robotically. Dragon then looked out over the front of Naruto's ship where he saw the waves start to end, well I'd love to chat with you for a bit longer but you seem to be headed into the calm belt and I just don't feel like going that far. I've got to stay with my men. 
Naruto and Mura turned and looked at how far they had gotten from the rest of the ships around Centauria before Naruto started fishing around in the pockets of his vest, turning back around to Dragon holding a Horatian Kanai, I can just take. He turned to find Dragon no longer there, where'd he go? Soren where'd he go? Soren looked down and scratched his head under his bandana, I've got no idea Uzumaki I was looking at Centauria. I wasn't keeping an eye on the guy. He's really fast, Murat said rather fearfully. I'm just as fast as he is. Naruto replied, looking over at the ships that were getting further away on the horizon, and I just met another person that's supposed to be one of the strongest men in the world. He smirked, you know, I still really want to fight him. Isn't that messed up? A frown then came over his face, I don't like the way he's trying to deal with the world government though, but someone like that isn't going to listen to someone like me. After letting silence settle for a moment, Murat let out a huge sigh and dropped to her backside on the deck, I just came face to face with, the revolutionary dragon, I really don't think I'll ever get used to being on this ship. Naruto then frowned and stomped his foot on the deck angrily, it, I can't even call Luffy and tell him. I promised that I wouldn't tell anyone that I knew he was Luffy's dad. I didn't even know Luffy had parents. Who has to get together to create a guy like Luffy? Naruto scratched his scalp, Luffy's got the weirdest family members. Two days later, the Den Den Mushi belonging to the crew, complete with having its S painted in crew colors of orange and blue with the crew Jolly Roger emblazoned on it in the common area was steadily ringing off of the hook, eventually finding itself answered by Miss Valentine, oh. She said effing herself over a nearby couch to lay down while she was talking. Where is Uzumaki Naruto? The voice on the other line said to her, getting straight to the point. Miss Valentine said in procrastination to the rather impatient sounding voice, that's not the kind of tone you use when you want someone to do something for you. The right thing to say would have been, if it isn't any trouble could you let me speak to Uzumaki Naruto. I would have also accepted anything with the word please in it as an answer. She said, a bright smile on her face as she let out a small laugh. It was so much fun messing with strangers, much more fun than messing with her friends. She could hear the voice growl at her on the other line and she had to take her mouth away from the receiver to keep from laughing into the line and pissing the person off even more. If she was going to upset him then she wanted to make it more challenging for herself than just laughing at him. The gruff voice tried to regain his composure before trying again, is Uzumaki Naruto there or not? I was told that this was how to reach him besides the other more direct way. Miss Valentine looked at her nails, pondering whether or not she had time to paint them and finish before she could get this guy to lose his cool and hang up, Naruto, well he might be here. Then again he might not be. He has a habit of jumping ship and showing back up whenever he wants to in the blink of an eye. For all I know he could be a hundred miles away or right in his room. I'm not feeling quite up for getting up to check though. His room is a long walk. She said, looking directly at the door that Naruto's quarters sat behind not even 10 feet from where she was laying down at. All right I've had it up to here with you woman. Uzumaki or not if you don't tell me where he is I don't care who you are to him I will find you and turn you into a chew toy do you understand? Tell Uzumaki that Jabura of CP9 is asking for him. CP9. Oh that just made this all the more fun for her. She didn't even care how they got this number, they had tried to defeat her and her friends and haul her former boss Nico Robin off to impel down. She opened her mouth, about to come up with something to really piss the guy off when she heard a voice that stopped her. Who are you talking to on the Den Den Mushi Valentine Chan? Miss Valentine leaned her head back on the arm of the couch and looked up bullishly at Naruto who was standing over her looking down with a curious look on his face. A smile slowly broke out on Miss Valentine's face as they both heard the Den Den Mushi rant in the place of the person on the end of the line. Her bright green eyes shone with amusement as she handed the receiver over to Naruto, someone for you. She said cheekily. Naruto rolled his eyes and took it from her, hey what are you doing talking to the CP9 anyway? Naruto forced her to scoot over on the couch so that he could sit down and begin speaking, this is Uzumaki Naruto. It took long enough for you guys to call. I didn't think you would ever try to get in contact with me, I was getting ready to chalk that one up as a loss. Jabura's voice on the other end noticeably calmed down as it began to speak to Naruto, yeah well we ran into a few misadventures. 
we had to leave St. Poplar because we wound up annihilating a stupid group of pirates that went there to start trouble, then we went home. You guys have a home? Naruto asked incredulously. Well it made sense. Everyone had to come from somewhere so why would CP9 be any different, never mind, what's going on now? Keep me in the loop here. Well we've got a ship. Jabura said, seeming like he didn't know what to say from there, and, that's pretty much it. Luchi's all healed up, and he wants to go after Spandam. He's not dead but your boy with the acid pretty much melted tons of his skin off. That's what we heard anyway. Naruto leaned back in the couch as Miss Valentine put her head on his shoulder and yawned, you're not going to find Spandam anytime soon. And is Luchi there with you right now? He asked not really waiting for a response, I don't care, I hope he is, because he's an idiot for telling Spandam that you guys were still alive. Miss Valentine couldn't help but laugh at Naruto calling out CP9's strongest member, now he's going to send someone after you to cover his own tracks and keep himself clean of everything that happened at Eni's lobby. I thought you guys were ins, you don't tell your target you're coming. Silence reigned over the line for a moment before Jabura spoke up again, yeah, Luchi wants to defeat you now for that crack you made about him. Tell him to get in line. Naruto quipped dryly, putting an arm around Miss Valentine. Just keep in touch, remember that you can call me anytime, and don't abuse the Horatian Kanai or summon me for something stupid. I'll call you guys sooner than later for more. Got it Uzumaki. And with that the phone call ended. Miss Valentine turned her eyes towards Naruto's blue ones and decided to ask the question that her gaze was already doing for her, so why are you in contact with CP9? Why are you even helping them? They tried to defeat the Straw Hats remember? You tried to defeat me, remember? Naruto replied before giving her a on the forehead, and Spandam was the one of them that I had the most problem with. We have the same guy as a target only they're actively seeking him. They're doing my job for me so that I don't go off looking for a ghost. If I find Spandam I'll just tell them and they can handle him. Then they'll owe me. Understanding what he was trying to do, give the CP9 a purpose and get himself some form of allies, Miss Valentine nodded, you've got friends in low places Naruto. You've got a group of ins almost at your beck and call. A nod came from her fellow blonde, you say that like it's a bad thing Valentine Chan. Sometime later, are you sure you want to fight me? Soren asked Nojiko as he stood across from her on the portion of the deck cleared for training outside, I won't go easy on you the way Uzumaki does. I can lower my acid level enough to keep it from being fatal, but might end up ruining the fabric of the pretty little designer clothes you prance around in. A smirk then came over his face, I might get a free show out of this if I'm feeling mean you know. Nojiko merely stepped into her waver skates and smacked her heels together to kickstart them, levitating her right off of the ground, first of all, I don't prance. She said with a dangerous lift in her voice as she drew her pistols from her holsters, second of all, I never asked you to go easy on me. And third of all, she twirled her pistols around on her fingers before grabbing a tight hold of them, you have to hit me first to worry about doing anything to my clothes. I don't know where you're getting all of your... Soren then stopped what would have been a smart remark as he could see how confident she was and could only draw one real conclusion as to why she would be about fighting him, even in a spar, crap, you can use those things the right way now can't you? Uh huh. Nojiko said cheerfully, I called Nami for advice because she has an actual waiver, it turns out all I needed was a delicate touch. So what? Mobility was only half of the battle. She still had to be able to do him damage to beat him. Just so I know, how many special element swows can you do now? Soren asked her aloud out of curiosity. More. Nojiko said with a grin forming on her face, way more. But don't worry, I can't use the earth, lightning, or water elements yet. Just wind and fire. She finished with a wink, you're lucky. I don't feel lucky. Soren muttered, slapping himself across the face to psyche himself up, you inherited Uzumaki's mean streak didn't you? Prior to a fight he just had to get in one jab, no matter how bad the outcome might be, I guess all that sex with him had to benefit you in some other way huh? And as he saw Nojiko give him an emotionless look as she put up her pistols and pulled her swaugen from her back he felt that he would wind up paying for that sometime before they called an end to the spar, because it wouldn't be his choice when they stopped. Meanwhile, Naruto stood at the helm as he could hear Nojiko's swaugen ring out with a swow that made Soren shriek like a girl. I hope he dodged that. He said to himself. 
if Nojiko was really that much stronger with her new S defeats then maybe he didn't have to get Soren back himself, maybe Nojiko would do it for him. He turned around and looked up in the air to see Vivi fighting in the branches of the tree-like masts against Polly, using his ropes against her sharp jewel weapons. Vivi was definitely coming along, and he knew that Polly wasn't necessarily weak in his own right after the short fight they had at Water 7. As fast as it looked that Vivi would cut through his ropes he would seemingly come up with even more to keep himself in the air and counterattack with. Naruto had to wonder where he kept all of the rope. Things were moving along smoothly. They were right on track to not only get back on their route on the Grand Line towards Constellation Island, but to jump further ahead than their original route would have set them on. So with getting knocked off course combined with cutting their original route in half they were right back on schedule. They were able to totally bypass the Florian Triangle on the way as well to boot. Who cared that they were cutting through the comm belt to get there? That was why the bottom of the ship was lined with sea stone and why it was so valuable, so that they could do things like that. Naruto didn't know that the ship he commandeered from Kami Island would be so valuable when he took it. He was glad he seemed to have such an eye for useful things. Soren. What? Your ink firing away with the swaugen, scaring the out of me. How am I supposed to keep control over the acid level like that when I think I'm going to die? Naruto turned around to find Nojiko floating on her waver skates glaring at Soren because apparently he had gotten a hit in on Nojiko with one of his attacks and had managed to disintegrate her top, leaving her in a black bra. The acid spitting man crossed his arms and turned away indignantly with a scoff, I'm a grown man. You act like I've never seen before. You've still got the bra so shut up and fight. He then started dancing as small fireballs were fired at his feet. Nojiko was steadily firing at Soren, having switched weapons to her faster default guns, her pistols, using regular ammunition to save her chakra for the moment, stop moving it. How's that not being crazy thing working for you Noji-chan? Naruto asked her loudly in amusement. Being mad isn't the same thing as being crazy Naruto-kun. Nojiko snapped back at him as she reloaded her guns before returning her attention to fighting Soren. Yes he certainly did have an eye for useful things, and crazy things, and pretty things too. Sometimes all of them rolled up into one. At that moment he felt a familiar pull in the back of his mind over a long distance. Someone had thrown his Horatian Kanai, and no one bothered trying to call first either so it was an emergency. Setting the wheel in place, Naruto jumped between Soren and Nojiko's duel and stopped their fighting with his presence, I've got to go. You guys know the drill for how to run things while I'm gone right? Both of them nodded, seeing how serious he was, good. I'll be back soon okay. He gave Nojiko a and disappeared in a yellow flash. I wonder what's wrong. Nojiko wondered, touching her where Naruto had just at her, I've never seen him look that serious before leaving before. Soren just grunted, we'll find out when he gets back. Just don't worry about it. He said putting a hand on the despondent young woman's shoulder, you want to shoot at me again. It might make you feel better. He offered, getting a slow nod from Nojiko, okay, let's get back to shooting me. Hit me if you can. Moments prior with Straw Hat Crew, one large trap for their ship and crew led to the Straw Hat Crew being stuck in the middle of the largest ship in the entire world. A rather eerie ship that had set up shop in the Florian Triangle, a place notorious for losing entire ships and crews. Well they soon found out that much of this was because of the efforts of Gecko Mariah, a man using the reputation of the area to trap victims for his own purposes, to build an army of zombies. It also didn't help that the man was supposed to be a Shichibukai. The entire ship Thriller Bark was an island converted into a ship and thus had things like dead forests, a graveyard, a morbid mansion and all sorts of things as well as around 1000 inhabitants, mostly zombies under Gecko Mariah's control. And the strongest one had currently taken the full measure of most of the straw hats and had left them defeated. He was four times the size of a regular giant and had long blonde hair that flowed from his head to his back with two large horns on the top of his head. He had a MIV underbite with large fangs and even tusks as well as only one eye. His body had stitches all over, especially around his stomach where a blue cloth was placed. He wore a large black loincloth with three giant skulls strapped to a rope to hold it up. On the ground, beaten upright at his feet lay Frankie, Usopp, Chopper, Sanji, Zoro, Robin, and a strange skeleton with an afro wearing a formal suit, 
I, the Mib creature groaned as it looked at wanted posters of the straw hats taped to his arm, let's see who's left. The straw hat guy from earlier, some orange haired girl, and the superhero. Why are those three missing? The giant wondered as he scratched his head. He then shrugged carelessly and began tearing apart the mansion right by him with his fists trying to find Nami, Luffy, and Usopp, who he had already defeated without really knowing. Meanwhile Robin weakly lifted her head to see the giant destroying everything to find the remaining two members he had yet to defeat. She fished through her clothes and managed to pull out Naruto's Horatian Kanai, staring at it intensely, as much as I don't want to bother you to ask you for help, I think we could use it right about now. She looked over the downed and wounded crewmates that were there with her, yeah we could probably use it. She then took aim at the giant and threw it as hard as she could. The kanai stuck itself in the giant's fist just as it was throwing another punch to destroy another wall of the Mib mansion. Robin only let her head lay back down so that she could take some time to rest so that she and the others could get up to fight again soon, I really hope you can help us Naruto. With the Horatian kanai in a flash of yellow, Naruto appeared in a pile of rubble, picking his kanai up out of the wreckage, man who threw this thing hard enough to take out a wall. He then saw a few figures running down the hall he found himself in, oi. What's going on around here? Who summoned me? A group of animal hybrid zombies stopped just as a younger girl wearing red tick and gothic eyeliner with pink hair and two high pigtails did. She had a red crown on the top of her head, wore black and white stockings that went all the way up her legs. She also wore red buckled boots, a red mini skirt with white stars, a white long sleeved shirt, and a red fabric covering her shoulders. She turned her big round eyes towards Naruto and stomped on the ground in a small fit, what are you doing you idiot? The giant oars is going to squish us all if we don't get out of here. Giant what? Naruto asked her with a tilted head, look, have you seen a guy with a straw hat or anyone with him? They're friends of mine, they should have been the ones that called me. I need to know why I'm here and what I'm supposed to do to help out. Distracted from her impending doom from the rampaging giant momentarily by how she thought the way Naruto looked when he was confused was cute, the girl snapped out of it once she heard that the crew that was causing Thriller Bark so much trouble and had defeated her were friends with this guy, I wasn't going to steal the straw hats ship to get off of this island. What gave you that crazy idea? She said before laughing nervously. You did. Naruto said with a deadpan look, can you help me find them or not? He didn't have time to sit here with this girl, he couldn't see any of his friends around and he knew that they wouldn't have called him for nothing to a place like this. Get me off of Thriller Bark and we'll see. The girl persisted, really wanting to run away from the ship, you don't get it. Orz is taking this whole place out looking for a girl. I'm a girl. She started bawling uncontrollably as the zombies around her tried to console her, I'm too cute to die. What's an Orz? Naruto asked, not really getting the gist of what they were talking about, I think I'm missing a huge chunk of what your point is supposed to be, he said, trailing off to get her name. My name is Perona, she yelled, stomping over to Naruto, and Orz is the giant looking for a girl. Now get me out of here Mr. Straw Hat friend. All of those straw hats were really strong. They had to have strong friends too didn't they? Especially if this guy was insisting that they called him here to help them out. Naruto looked around the empty, but ruined hallway and shrugged, what giant? At that point a giant face appeared looking upside down through the hole in the wall, staring at Naruto and Perona with one good eye, having been attracted by the racket Perona had been making, oh, that giant. He then looked back at the shaking Perona who was crying anime tears at this point, do you care where I take you as long as it's out of thriller bark? Just get me out of here, this is way too much. Perona whimpered, staring directly into the one eye of Oars, I really don't care. I was planning on getting out of here anyway. This place is done for. Naruto nodded, good to know. He then dropped his Horatian Kanai on the ground and grabbed Perona, disappearing in a flash of yellow just as a Mib hand reached inside to grab a hold of them both. On board the natural disaster, Naruto and Perona landed on his bed with Naruto jumping up immediately and setting himself to work, where are we? She asked, looking around frantically, how did we get here so fast? She tried to get Naruto to explain to her as she saw him throw his headband onto the ground. Don't worry about that, Naruto said as he started pacing around the room, pulling out a scroll and unraveling it before making a cage bunchen to sit on it and begin meditating. 
the original then started stretching his arms out to get ready for a fight, I'll take you back there after it's all over. No. Verona yelled, jumping off of the bed and latching herself around his legs, don't take me back there. Orz is going to defeat everybody. Naruto rolled his eyes and pried the younger girl off of his legs, calm down, go outside, say I got you out of wherever we just were. You can stay here until I handle that Orz thing. Just be good and don't bother my clone alright. Now let go unless you want to go back with me. That got Perona off of him in a flash, she didn't want anything to do with going back there. Naruto then let out a desperate sigh, I can already tell that I'm going to hate fighting this fight. He said before waving goodbye to Perona and vanishing with the Horatian no Jutsu. Perona just stared at where Naruto had once been and blinked, wow that was pretty cool. She then frowned at the clone that was steadily meditating, too bad he's going to die though. Nobody can beat Ors. Perona decided to go outside and see just where in the world she was, oh well, let's see where this is. Thriller barked Naruto reappeared right back in the same spot he had vanished from moments before only there was no Ors staring dead at him. Naruto picked up his Horatian Kanai and ran towards the hole in the wall, looking out to see most of the straw hat pirates down below. Minus Nami and Luffy, bringing a satisfied grin to his face, Oi. What's up you guys? I'm here. He only saw them staring up at him as if they had seen a ghost. Naruto jumped out of the upper story of the mansion to the courtyard below and walked over the rubble to greet them since the giant didn't seem to be anywhere in sight. The first thing he noticed was that they all looked pretty beaten up, you all look beat the up. What ran you guys over? It was at that moment that he noticed that no one had any snappy comeback or remark to his appearance, but they were still looking up behind him from the spot he had jumped down from, what the air you guys looking at? At that moment, Oars crashed down on the ground behind Naruto on his stomach, facing his back in the front of all the present straw hat pirates. Robin merely pointed at the ugly visage of the giant that was breathing directly down Naruto's back, that's what we're looking at. Naruto didn't even bother turning around as he could already feel the giant's wow breath on the back of his person, so is anyone going to tell me what's going on here? He asked as he flexed his fingers into and out of tensed fists. Yeah, Sanji said, smoking a cigarette just as calmly as Naruto seemed to be at the moment, something that Zoro and Robin shared, were fighting that thing. All of the others nodded in agreement. Thanks. Naruto said sarcastically, I couldn't have figured that one out on my own. On board the natural disaster, Perona walked outside and marveled at the appearance of the ship that the blonde guy brought her to, wow, this is a really nice ship. I think I'll take it. There aren't even that many people here. She said as she then came upon the rest of the crew that had been outside, alright, if you would all just hand over this ship everything will be fine. Soren and Nojiko stopped fighting, and even Bibi and Polly dropped down from their mid-air battle to stare at the strange girl. Soren and Nojiko looked at each other before Soren spoke up, um, exactly who the air you? What's with people just showing up on our ship? He mused quietly. Nojiko had a frown marring her pretty face as she could only yume there was one reason that this girl was here, yeah, I think Naruto-kun is going to have a serious story to tell when he gets back. Perona was beginning to get impatient with the crew talking amongst themselves, are you going to give me the ship or not? Nojiko, Soren, Polly, and Bibi all gave her a deadpan look as they got into their respective fighting stances against Perona. Nojiko pointing her pistols at her while levitating off of the ground with her waver skates, Soren with his acid nails set in a steaming haze rising off of his body, Bibi holding her sharp ranged weapons, and Polly ready to produce his ropes from his clothing, how about not? They all said simultaneously. Perona balked at seeing all of them ready for a fight. Now that she was able to get a closer look she had to say that none of them looked weak. Maybe she should have behaved like that other guy told her to in the first place. Who the is this? She heard voices as from behind her as Johnny and Yosaku came walking out as well to surround her on both sides. She was probably better off at Thriller Bark. Chapter 34, Splitting Your Chances. Naruto turned around to face Orr's mid face, lowered down to get a ground view of him and all of the Straw Hat Pirates present. Sick of having Orr's fetid breath heaving on him repeatedly, he looked at the grotesque giant zombie and cracked his knuckles before in a fist back, set on trying to knock his block off. At least he was before a set of hands grew on his body and held him in place, what the? Robin Chan why? 
I didn't call you to fight the giant for us Naruto. Robin said, using her powers to keep him from stepping in for them. Then why am I even here? Naruto asked, still frozen in the pose of loading up a punch meant for Oars. Gomu Gomu no Shiromochi gum gum butt stomp. Oars jumped his mib body into the air and aimed his backside to slam down on Naruto and all of the present straw hats. Robin let go of Naruto thus allowing him to escape the affected area of Oars' attempt. What kind of bull attack was that? Naruto yelled, pointing at Oars who was getting up from his seated position on the ground, and why did it call it out the way Luffy does? That was useless, he didn't even stretch anything. And Naruto had to say it was probably for the best that a giant bigger than any giant he had already seen couldn't also stretch or else they might not have been able to dodge that so easily. Man that was a scary thought. Frankie growled at Oars and ran towards Zoro and Sanji, alright, let's see how this guy likes our new team move. Guys, we're using Tactics 15. Chopper looked shocked at that news, wait, we're going to do that here. He sounded almost excited about it as he started running towards Zoro and Sanji with Frankie. Frankie started barking orders to Zoro and Sanji, Zoro. Swirly brows. Stand by. Now grab onto my feet. He yelled as he jumped into the air with a small chopper on top of his head. Both Zoro and Sanji looked perturbed as he did this, catching him and placing him on one shoulder each. Even Usopp had a place, staying attached and keeping his arms above his head in a pincer-like manner and wrapping his legs around Frankie's forearm as Frankie grabbed around his body with his large right hand. So now it was Frankie as the center, elevated off of the ground by his legs by Zoro and Sanji acting as extensions of them, with Usopp as an extension of a right arm and Chopper sitting on top of his head, Pirate Docking 6. Giant Robot Warrior. Big Emperor. Chopper then noticed something wrong, wait up Frankie. The left arm still hasn't docked yet. And it was true because the left arm of this combination was not there, it was still just Frankie's arm. Frankie looked over at Robin and Naruto, both of whom were looking at what was transpiring with differing expressions, oi. What are you doing Nico Robin? Hurry up and dock onto my left arm. Quick. Just like Usopp is doing. I just can't do it. Robin said calmly, hiding her own annoyance at the scene, it's just too embering. She finished, much to the shock of her comrades stuck in the upper portions of the robot. Ooh. Naruto started waving his hands around, let me do it. I want to do it. Can I do it? It was now Robin's turn to give Naruto a shocked look as he was legitimately psyched to be there at the moment, I like what I see and I want to be a part of it. Super. Frankie said holding his left arm out for Naruto to link up with, which he gleefully did in the same manner as Usopp, substitute left arm, docking complete. Robin palmed her face before looking over at Oars who was looking at the robot, with rapt attention being paid, he actually wanted to see it happen. Well at least it explained why none of them were squashed just now as long as that took. Frankie held his left arm and Naruto out to point at Oars, alright you giant bad guy, are you ready to face the super might of the big emperor? And Oars seemed stoked as he nodded rapidly, left arm, fire. Naruto looked back at Frankie with a dry look, fire what? Frankie blinked, you know, just, fire. He said, shaking his arm as if that would make something happen. This time Naruto tilted his head in confusion, I don't even know what I'm supposed to be firing. Be more specific, your command list s. Fire. Fire what? I thought you had a plan or something. The plan was for you to fire. Fire what? Frankie was seething by this point due to his belligerent, left arm, Naruto I swear if you don't. Oh, wait, never mind, I know what to do. Naruto said, cutting Frankie off as he formed a reverse ram seal, Mugiwarabushi Kanbi Henge, Kukai no Kaiyu Caged Straw Hat Combination Transformation, ocean shadow of the high seas. A large puff of smoke shrouded the MIB construct humans, a cyborg, and a reindeer. The smoke cleared to reveal a large, humanoid robot over 15 feet tall with a red core decorated with yellow flowers, a head that looked as if it was covered with a ninja face mask and had a pink samurai helmet on its head with a pair of reindeer horns on the top, a right arm that looked like a brown pincered cannon, a red left arm with a bright yellow hand that had a swirl pattern in the palm, a sleek jet black left leg, and a green right leg that looked to be covered in sharp armor. Robin just stared blankly in abject surprise as the robot seemed to wiggle all of its body parts and look itself over. 
It eventually snapped into a pose giving the thumbs up with its left arm as Naruto's voice came out in a slightly warped, metallic way, there. I got your, big emperor, for you right here. Zoro's voice filtered through, sounding similarly metallic, I have to admit, this isn't as stupid as I thought it was going to be when we started this. He said in a mildly impressed manner. Stupid. Usopp's metallic voice chimed in, how about totally awesome. This is great. Frankie let out a triumphant laugh, his voice warped like all of the others as Big Emperor turned towards Robin and began flexing. Ha, I bet you wish you docked up now, Honeyko Robin. Meanwhile Robin refrained from stating the obvious, that if she had linked up with the others they still would have looked stupid. Big Emperor then turned towards Orz and aimed the left arm, now left arm, fire. Fire what? Sanji's voice yelled in a perturbed manner, if Frankie if you want something to fire then use Usopp not Naruto. Oh. I knew that. Frankie said, sounding quite embered before switching his aiming arm from the left to the right, right arm, fire. And this time a large multicolored flaming bird flew from the cannon right arm, Niji ho o boshi rainbow phoenix star. The huge flaming bird crashed into the gawking oar's face and sent him stumbling back with the flames dissipating after the explosion, gah. I wasn't ready, you cheaters. Oars yelled as he patted out the flames on his face. Wow. Usopp said in surprise, that was new. It was just supposed to be a high no Tori Boshi, firebird star. Naruto's voice explained as best he could, it's a combination hench. I'm drawing on everyone's chakra in addition to mine to keep this transformation going. That means that chakra is circulating freely just to keep this body, so everything is enhanced. Super. Frankie shouted before breaking Big Emperor into another pose, now let's take this big freak down and get Straw Hat's shadow back. With Sanji and Zoro for legs, the entire construct rushed towards Oars who angrily attempted to flatten everyone with a palm strike that was hastily dodged by Big Emperor jumping up onto the arm and running up the length of it towards Oars' head. They only got to the forearm before Oars picked up a chunk of debris with his other arm and attempted to smash Big Emperor like an ant crawling on someone's arm, but the right leg Zoro lashed out and cut right through the debris before Big Emperor jumped and delivered a spin kick with the left leg Sanji that snapped the arm away and swung Oars body to spin around facing away from the still mid-air combination transformation, leaving him off balance, Kayaku no Arashi gunpowder storm. As the left arm of Big Emperor started firing rapid fire exploding pellets at the back of Oars' head, the right hand of Big Emperor swung outward and opened wide as it formed a mid blue ball the entire size of Big Emperor himself, Tikoku Odama Rasengan, Imperial Great Ball Spiraling Sphere. Super. As Frankie yelled, Big Emperor seemed to be propelled forward at a faster rate than before by some kind of gaseous exhaust as the gargantuan Rasengan was driven right into Oars' back, driving him into the ground. As Oars was brutally plowed into the ground and dust rose up from the impact of the attack Robin blinked, the only indication that she had been completely stunned by what she had just seen, that stupid combination thing actually worked. She then ran over to where Big Emperor jumped out of the cloud. Big Emperor landed on its left leg and started hopping to the left, ending in a stomp that left him posed kabuki style with the left arm palm out pointing at Robin and the right arm pointing directly back, that's right. Naruto's distorted voice shouted, because when you deal with weird undead giants and similar otherworldly freaks you need to be able to get just as freaky. And there's nobody freakier on the face of the planet than Uzumaki Naruto. At that moment, Big Emperor was engulfed in a puff of smoke and once it cleared it revealed that everyone was separated and back to normal. Frankie exclaimed in a displeased manner once he realized this, hey. Why'd you break the formation? We were kicking that guys. Naruto shrugged, I can feel everyone's chakra when using Kanbi Henge because I'm using your chakra too and you guys were running out fast. If I used too much of your chakra I could have defeated you. He made the right decision too because Usopp was on his hands and knees panting heavily, Chopper was panting with his lolling out, and the others didn't exude exhaustion nearly as much, but Naruto wasn't a fool, he knew what he was feeling. Sanji and Zoro were running low quickly and from the sight of Frankie taking in more cola there was no way he couldn't say that his energy wasn't getting drained while they were in the henge. Sanji looked up and felt a wave of anxiety roll through him as something occurred that hadn't happened since they had entered Thriller Bark. He could see the sky. That was bad because it was almost dawn. Dawn was bad, very bad. 
they all had their shadows stolen. And long story short, if the sun of the new morning touched them then everyone missing a shadow was screwed because they would be vaporized, this is so not good. Naruto did not know this, why? I can actually see now. This is way better. Chopper and Zoro opened their mouths to yell at Naruto about why it was bad, one in a scared fashion and the other in an angry manner, but Robin created arms on their bodies to cover their mouths. He didn't know the situation and if he did there would have been a good chance of him panicking, we just have to hope that Luffy can defeat Gekko Mariah soon and get our shadows back. She said calmly. In the meantime, Zoro said, taking up a stance as he glared at the smoke still rising from where Oars was felled, if we can beat this guy then Luffy gets his shadow back. At least we can do that before dawn, even if we don't get our own shadows back. Kishishishishi. An arrogant voice cackled as the sounds of Oars moving to stand back up started ringing out, his feet smashing the rubble beneath him into the ground. All that Naruto knew was that the voice was not Oars, the sun's coming out in a short while and you all are so determined to beat Oars just so straw hat Luffy has a chance to beat me. Too bad he's not here. On Oars back was a mib groove where the last powerful Rasengan hit him. As Oars stood up and turned back towards them, Usopp's eyes widened, it's Mariah. He's there in Oars' tummy. He pointed frantically. Tummy. Every male that fancied themselves manly said to themselves humorously until they looked up and indeed saw a man inside of Oars' stomach. Naruto had to remark that the man was gargantuan, standing at least two entire bodies over him and rather chubby to boot. He had a very long head and neck with two small horns on his forehead, and red hair that stuck straight up. His ears and teeth were pointed and he had pale blue skin with a darker shade of blue for his. He wore a ruffled shirt and a black coat with the collar upturned in addition to a pair of black gloves. Naruto tilted his head to the side in pondering, so this is Gekko Mariya. Yeah, I don't know who that is. Sanji palmed his forehead, crap, Luffy got ditched somewhere, holy. Oars exclaimed excitedly as he looked down to try and see into his own stomach, there's a ink command unit in my stomach. That's so cool. I'm like a ink robot. Straw hat won't be coming. Mariah said confidently, come on, I'll give you guys a chance to beat me and take your shadows back. But to get to me first, you've got to beat Oars. He shouted as he began to cackle. Naruto stared up at Oars and Mariah, grinding his teeth, so does this thing have a weakness or something? What? Zoro asked, noticing the change in Naruto's demeanor. Weakness. Naruto shouted, what is it going to take to beat this thing quicker? Salt. Chopper said abruptly, Oars is a zombie and the zombies are weak against salt. It helps to purify them. He then looked over at Oars and the little reindeer faltered somewhat, there's no way we have enough salt for that though. Ah. Naruto grunted in exasperation before he realized that he could still smell the ocean through everything, and could feel the ground beneath him move. Apparently this was a ship no matter how much of an inland it appeared to be, I need time. I need a lot of time. Naruto said as he sat down on the ground where he stood and began to take on a meditative pose. Sanji looked at Naruto just sitting down in the middle of the battlefield, what the is he doing? He then saw Naruto begin to make slow, drawn out hand seals and remembered the first time he had seen Naruto fight back in Nami's hometown. The very first thing he had done to take out most of Arlong's men. But there was no water anywhere near them, that's why he needs time. He's going to do whatever he does to call the water. Can he do it? It didn't matter if he could or not. He was trying it, and regardless they still had to fight oars, so they would be holding off the giant zombie anyway. With that in mind he turned back towards oars and Mariah in his stomach. Mariah was looking past the contingent of straw hat pirates at Naruto, actually he was looking behind Naruto, ah, Kuma. Have you come to watch me destroy the straw hats the way I told you I would firsthand? The straw hats all turned around and saw the mib form of Bartholomew Kuma standing behind the meditating Naruto with a stony expression on his face, no. I've come to make sure your fight is with the straw hats only. He is not one of the straw hats, and with him they would destroy you. Kuma left no time for any arguments from Mariah as he lifted one of his hands to reveal pink paw pads on his palm, where would you like to go Uzumaki Naruto? He asked. Naruto opened his eyes and stopped making hand seals in time to roll forward out of the way of Kuma's attempt to slap down on him with his palm. Naruto fped and sprung back to his feet to face off with Kuma, you look like one of those things that me and my crew fought a while back. 
Those cyborgs, but you talk. So you did manage to destroy the other pacifista prototypes. Kuma said, as calm as ever, Vegapunk said that they weren't ready yet, but Fleet Admiral Sengoku would have no arguments. The upgraded versions are now far stronger. They were based on you. Naruto asked him, getting one stiff nod, and you're here for me. Kuma shook his head no, then why are you here? To inform my Shichibukai comrade of something. Kuma informed Naruto, but defeating you and capturing you would ease him, because like I said, you aren't a straw hat pirate. I don't know how you got here, but you shouldn't have come. He then disappeared from Naruto's sight, getting Naruto's eyes to widen before he himself did the same in a similar burst of speed in an attempt to keep up. Mariah began to laugh once Naruto and Kuma vanished from sight, Kishishishishi. That guy is a dead man walking. Kuma was one of the most brutal pirates ever even before he became a Shichibukai. Since then he's only grown stronger. Whatever he came for, it won't matter now after Kuma finishes him off. He then willed Or's body to move, but you shouldn't worry about that, you've got me to deal with. Get them Or's. He shouted as he sent the giant at them to attack. Naruto missed a swinging mid-air kick meant for Kuma and growled as he attempted to give chase again. With a guy that big, Naruto didn't want to risk reacting and setting himself on the defensive to see how strong his attacks were. He wanted to finish this as quickly as he could, but there was one thing that was for certain. Kuma was far faster than the cyborgs he, Soren, and Miss Valentine had fought a few months back. One second he was there, the next he wasn't. It was annoying, but he wasn't as fast as that light guy Kazaru. His movements were more sudden, and it didn't even seem like he was running. Thus far the two had engaged in a quick-paced dance through a dark forest of many dead trees. Right from the start as they started whipping across the landscape, possibly the large man's attempt to lead Naruto away from the others, Kuma would swing at Naruto with his mib arms as he attempted to slap him with an open palm, and Naruto would try to unleash a kick or an occasional Rasengan, but neither of them could make contact with the other. No time to mess around. Naruto thought as he had been in sage mode since right after dodging Kuma's first attack against him. He wasn't allowed the needed time to summon enough water towards the center of Thriller Bark, but he was given more than enough time to gather enough natural energy to enter sage mode. For some reason he felt that he needed to be in a hurry, because Don was bad. He didn't know why Don was supposed to be bad, since no one told him and he didn't really have time to ask, but for some reason Sanji thought it was bad, and Sanji was an astute enough fighter to not be concerned with something like that if it was something trivial. Which meant to Naruto that he had to get his back there as soon as he could in case there was something he could do. Easier said than done. The Horatian Kanai that Robin used to summon him in the first place was now with him, seeing as how he had never given it back to the crew. He couldn't just bolt over to them. He would have to run. As he tried once again to break off from Kuma and head back to where Gekko Mariah and Ors were to attempt to east his friends he was reminded once more why just trying to beat a hasty retreat was a horrible idea when he was forced to Kawerimi with a log to avoid a looping palm swipe from Kuma. That was why, because Kuma was absurdly fast. It was incredible. The pacifista he fought before were far slower than him. It was almost like fighting someone that could run as fast as Aokiji all over again, but his hands weren't as fast apparently because he could see Kuma's hands when he attempted to swat him with his wide open palms. He didn't know what would happen if he got hit with one of Kuma's open hands, but he wasn't keen on finding out, because when Kuma hit the log he used for Kawerimi the thing vanished. It wasn't smashed or obliterated, it just vanished. He would rather not find out what happened to it by meeting the same fate. At least there was one good thing about not being near the others. He didn't have to worry about them getting possibly swept up in his attacks, and Kuma was a Shichibukai, Naruto was sure he could take it. Naruto began to rapidly spin in a circle and exude M amounts of wind-natured chakra, Hakairashi Shujeki, destructive storm bombardment. A whirlwind of dust and debris formed around Naruto's body taking up the size and width of two Kumas as it began to quickly spin towards him and engulf him. As the whirlwind created by Naruto moved to cover Kuma to disguise Naruto for his high-speed taijutsu alt on Kuma, the aforementioned man simply stomped and set himself firmly entrenched into the ground as he lifted his hands and the moment he touched the outside of the whirlwind it disappeared without any trace to its previous presence, leaving Naruto's body visible as it flew towards Kuma with a kick that socked him right in the center of his chest. What just happened? 
Naruto wondered as the Mib whirlwind meant to keep him hidden while he attacked Kuma directly simply disappeared, but at least he got one solid kick off onto the man beforehand. He then registered the fact that Kuma was not sent hurtling through the forest after his kick. He only slid back with his feet buried in the ground up to 20 feet, I kicked him so hard my foot should have shattered his ribs. But then he registered the fact that no one he fought could be expected to follow the norms of what he expected out of normal people. It was getting harder and harder to bludgeon his enemies into submission. So there was another route he could take to end a battle quicker, especially since they were in a forest. Naruto jumped back off of Kuma's chest and FPED backwards, placing his palm against a tree and making a half tiger seal to help him build his chakra. Mokuten, Haoshi Basudo, would release. Spore burst. A series of sickly discolored mushrooms formed on the trunk of the tree before it exploded, engulfing the entire area in purple powder. Naruto jumped out of the cloud of spores and looked back at the area covered in the poison material. If he left it he would be a err for a counterattack, and he would have to leave because he would be inhaling pure poison. Thus Naruto charged up a Rasengan and waited to spring into action once Kuma left the poison cloud. Contrary to what he thought though, Kuma's gait from the poison cloud was slow and steady. He walked right out of the cloud in front of Naruto's eyes, no effects of being inside of the poison for that long evident on his person. Kuma just put one hand back into the cloud and it instantly dispersed effortlessly, leaving nothing in the air at once inhabited. What kind of technique is that? Naruto felt the need to ask. Kuma could do the same to a log, to the poison on the battlefield, and probably to Naruto himself. Yeah there was definitely no way he was going to let Kuma touch him after seeing that. That wasn't really good. Naruto wasn't much for ranged fighting, and even his attacks that did have range as he was took a moment to load up, a moment that Kuma wouldn't let him have. I ate the Nikyu Nikyu no mi pa pa fruit. I don't feel that it would be important to tell you what that means though as you seem to get the general idea. Kuma said with confidence in this fact. I guess his power is to push stuff. Naruto figured in his head, he got rid of my poison cloud so easily, and my log didn't just vanish since he didn't destroy it either. Kuma could see the shimmer of realization in Naruto's eyes, yes, you seem as though you know enough about it without me saying a word. He then stomped and set his feet firmly back into the ground akin to a sumo wrestler as he seemed to be waiting to react to Naruto's more speedy attack. An attack that Naruto wasn't that eager to provide him with. Even in Sage mode, when Naruto hit something it moved. He could smack anyone around, even an admiral like Aokiji if he could make contact and hit them. Not with this one however. He actually hit Kuma, and he barely budged, and even if he hadn't budged his sternum should have been cracked or shattered from the single hit, but he was still moving around freely as if he hadn't taken the kick at all. I can break through stone without even trying in this mode. He could even injure Bluno of CP9's Tekai without even using Sage Mode, though admittedly Bluno was far from the strongest member of that group, he doesn't feel like a human though, oh crap. Naruto pointed at Kuma with a dry look on his face, you're just like those cyborg pacifista things aren't you? It wasn't a question so much as a tentative statement. If he was a normal human then he would have sickbed to the poison by now. Very astute of you. Kuma said as he set his hands back as if he were preparing for palm thrusts, now what will you do? Since you're way tougher than a person, Naruto said, still holding up his Rasengan, I'll just have to fight you without worrying about hurting you. You can take it, right? Are you finally coming to attack? Kuma questioned, his voice never differentiating from its usual stoic tone, I'm afraid it's too late for that, Padho pressure cannon. The air around Kuma shimmered, catching Naruto's eye as his optical orbs changed to that of the Rinnegan and he let the Rasengan dissipate so that he could shoot his hands directly forward. Shinra Tensai, heavenly subjugation of the omnipresent god. Two invisible forces from both combatants clashed between them and caused a loud banging clap between them that sounded like the loudest guns wow possible by the law of physics. A deep trench was ripped into the ground where the two forces clashed as the entirety of Thriller Bark shook from the force. Naruto and Kuma just stared at each other. The blonde with the abnormal eyes glared the calm and collected Kuma down as the ringing in his ears ran rampant due to the loud sound that had just blasted through his skull. In the distance there was a resounding crash as the body of oars flew from the inside of the castle courtyard, having broken through the wall, and landed hard in the outskirts of the forest lining the island, ship, that's right you guys. Kick the crap out of that giant zombie. 
Naruto's quirked upwards slightly before the expression faded as he formed a cross seal and five cage bunshin sprang into existence. On board the natural disaster, surrounded on both sides by the remainder of the foxhound pirates, sans Naruto, Perona let out a scoff at the way they were all prepared to fight. What was the big deal? All she wanted was to take their ship. That strong guy that took her there wasn't coming back, he was going to die on Thriller Bark, and someone like that had to be the captain. As long as that guy wasn't there she could beat the rest of those guys. So you all want to fight huh? Perona said confidently as everyone around her tensed in anticipation, Horororo, that's just fine with me, let's just see how you like my negative hollows. She said as she formed a quartet of small ghosts in her hands and sent them all out after the entire crew. As she saw the more physical fighters on the crew prepare to defend themselves by blocking whatever the ghosts could do, Nojiko saw a vision in her head of the entire crew, seemingly drained of their energy to fight, don't touch the ghosts, they'll take away your energy or something. She was vague on what exactly would happen if a ghost was touched, but either way it wouldn't have been good. You can't touch a ghost Nojiko Ainu. Johnny shouted, his hand on his sheathed sword, ready for action. Then why do you think you can cut one with your sword stupid? Nojiko responded loudly before kicking off with her waver skates to avoid the ghost sent after her. Johnny blinked behind his sungles before turning tail to run from the ghost sent after him, Nojiko's point made. Yosaku meanwhile, was running towards Perona with Kubikirabaucho ready to swing, Johnny. Get let's get her now. Johnny quickly dodged the ghosts after him, making an about face and charging directly at the girl directly with Yosaku. Johnny ducked and aimed low from one side while Johnny aimed high from another and cut at Perona mercilessly with one slash meant to take her down with no way to defend, Kyokuta no Jokyo, extreme elimination. Both swords merely ped through Perona's body harmlessly as if they never touched anything at all. Eb eb no deba, rot rot knife. Soren's use of Soru allowed him to give the ghosts pursuing him the S long enough to launch himself at Perona, maybe a special attack will put you down. A devil fruit to match a devil fruit. He yelled before running directly through Perona as if he never touched her at all. That won't work either. Why can't we hit this? Perona merely laughed as she flew into the air tauntingly, letting her ghosts flew all about the ship as they stuck out their S to mock the foxhound pirates. My devil fruit is the horo horo no mi, hollow hollow fruit. I control ghosts, so you can all give up on trying to hit me losers. She pulled down an eyelid and stuck out her, too bad I can still hit the lot of you. Johnny, Yosaku, and Soren all had one of Perona's ghosts pee through them, immediately forcing them to their knees with dull looks on their faces. Polly ceased in his attempts to evade Perona's ghosts to look at the trio that suddenly stopped moving, what are you idiots doing? Get up and keep fighting, we've got to subdue this chick. Stopping was his downfall as he took one of the ghosts flying through him from a blind spot. Oh please, Perona said as she floated around the deck nonchalantly, those three can't even find the inspiration to go on living anymore, let alone get up to keep on fighting a losing battle. I'll have this ship as mine by the time the sun rises. She then noticed Vivi dodging all four of her ghosts without even moving that far from where she initially started from, what's this? Hey, hold still and just give up already. You can't beat me, and you'll just get hit eventually. The four ghosts after Vivi were more or less making a dome of activity as Vivi seemed to dodge them with F, handsprings, rolls, spins, and flexible movements of her body, as if. Vivi said calmly, speaking as casually as if she were discussing the weather, if this is the best you've got then I can just do this until you get bored and go away ghost girl. What? Perona shrieked indignantly at Vivi making her ghosts look useless, but you aren't even that fast. How are you dodging my negative hollows so easily? Soren and Johnny were so fast she couldn't even see them and even they were caught off guard and hit with her ghosts. High up on one of the branches of the mast, seemingly forgotten by their attacker, Nojiko and Miss Valentine looked down at Vivi dodging attacks, huh? Miss Valentine said thoughtfully, you know, now that I see her using it like this, and now that I remember how she was using it on that island in the calm belt, I can really see her training paying off. Nojiko nodded in agreement with Miss Valentine's point, who would have thought? Kyahahaha. She finished with her usual good-natured laugh. All of a sudden Perona's form grew to an intimidating size as she yelled angrily, stop mocking me. She shouted as her ghost suddenly vanished from sight, 
You think you're so smooth, let's see how you like the mini hollows. She opened her hands to reveal multiple ghosts, smaller than the originals before sending them out at Bibi once more. Once again, Bibi got caught up in a game of dodging these troublesome ghosts, getting caught in the pattern of them being unable to touch her despite the greater numbers this time around. Perona's face looked rather angry until it gave way to a victorious smirk. She lifted her hand and snapped her fingers, causing the ghosts that Bibi had been dodging to detonate, catching the princess in a series of explosions that threw her to the ground, singed and wounded. No fair, Bibi said, gritting her teeth through the pain as she tried to stand back up, albeit slowly. Despite all of the training she had undertaken she was still less than used to taking exorbitant amounts of punishment. She was proud of herself though, all the things she had done, as far as she had come, and there was no way some weird girl with ghost powers was going to keep her down after just one good swow, but, this isn't like Alabasta. I'm not as weak as I was back then. She then looked up to the looming form of Perona, and I don't really care that you don't fight fair, because I've been fighting someone that never does things cleanly. Compared to him, you're just annoying, so just go haunt someone else. Annoying. Perona cried out with a tick mark forming on her head, we'll see how annoying I am when you and your friends are bowing at my feet. Bibi took a deep breath before getting in a ready stance, prepared to begin moving again, you won't even touch me again, so how are you going to make anyone bow? Perona's body shrank back to normal size before she formed another ghost, only this time it was larger than her entire body, so you're good at dodging. Well let's see how well you dodge this. However before anything could even happen Perona's body just disappeared out of the air. Bibi fell down on her backside and blinked. She had been prepared for some kind of intense conflict and then her opponent just up and disappeared without a trace, wh what. She then pouted, wait, I was all set for a big clash or something. Where'd that ghost girl go? She looked up at the branches sticking out of the mast at Nojiko and Miss Valentine who simply shrugged in confusion until the door to the common room of the ship was kicked open and Karu pointed a wing inside. Moments earlier inside the natural disaster, Murat was crouched and looking outside of the window of the common room at the conflict transpiring outside. Part of her wanted to go out there since it was an overwhelming numbers advantage, but then when she saw the weird powers Perona had she figured that she would be more of a hindrance than a help. Even with Funk Free, they can't even hit that girl, what good would I be if I went out there? Even if I tried a sneak attack I wouldn't do anything to her. Quack. Nura turned around to see Karu standing behind her with the exact same girl outside raising right there on his back. The large duck walked over and set Perona down on one of the couches and stared at her, tapping her lightly a few times with his beak before turning to look at Murat. Murat just looked between the Perona inside unconscious on the couch and the Perona outside currently fighting with Bibi about several times with a deadpan look on her face before standing and motioning for Karu to pick Perona back up. The duck did so dutifully and followed Murat as she went to the bathtub provided in common women's bathroom on the ship and began to fill it with water. After it filled, Karu had to let out a few snickers in his own way as he did not hesitate to toss Perona into the water. Perona immediately surfaced, sputtering although she could not even move, and found Funkfried in sword form at her throat. She looked up and saw the irritated face of Murat as the one holding the sword to her neck as Karu left to inform the others on what was happening. As she spoke, Murray's tone was one of contempt, so could you go ahead and explain to me how you got here and why you thought it would be a good idea to attack my friends. Thriller barked Naruto vs Kuma, Naruto and his five clones stared Kuma down, so why does a Shichibukai come to a place where another one is? I've never seen two of you together. Kuma ignored Naruto's question and asked one of his own, there are many pirates that would jump at the chance to join the ranks of Shichibukai. You were offered a position by Don Quixote da Flamingo and yet you turned the offer down. You had no reason not to. You're marking yourself as a target, a bounty like yours that refuses to join. One of the Naruto's shook his head, I was never the best at taking orders from anyone, and the more I hear about the world government the less I like about it. I wouldn't ever enjoy any of the missions they sent me on, and I don't like just exterminating people for no reason. He let out a laugh, I'd be more trouble to you guys if I joined actually. It's too late for that. The position has been filled. Kuma stated firmly, with no room for any argument, you're now just like any other pirate, 
you're actually worse off since you are very famous, and my mission is to defeat all of the witnesses on Thriller Bark should the Straw Hat Pirates defeat Gecko Mariah. The defeat of another Shichibukai cannot be made public knowledge the way Crocodile's defeat was. I am fighting you now instead of waiting since if you were to east the Straw Hats the result of the battle would be a foregone conclusion. So you're going to defeat them. Or should I say us? Another of the Naruto's asked with a tilt of his head, getting a nod from Kuma, well, in that case. And the six Naruto's scattered and began to dart all over the increasingly wrecked forest as the battle proceeded to escalate. Kuma hunkered himself down firmly and began shooting rapid fire palm thrusts, Saperi Pad Hope slapping thrust pressure cannon. An absurd number of pressurized swows flew from his hands at the clones. Three of the clones were destroyed as they were directly in front of Kuma, however two clones and the original Naruto still remained. Two of Naruto's clones got Kuma's backside, both holding Odama Rasengan's, however Kuma whipped around and held his hands out just as the attacks got close. The moment they made contact they merely seemed to veer to the side and fly directly away from Kuma, smashing into trees in the forest and dispelling. However his back was open, and Naruto certainly wasn't one of his clones to be defeated so easily, Senpo, Rasenkara, Sage Art, Spiraling S. Naruto's arms were out in front of him as his body was completely covered in a Rasengan. He more or less body tackled Kuma with his body enshrouding Rasengan that resulted in a MIV explosion that rocked the forest once more, tearing trees apart. At the edges of the carnage, Naruto, covered in a few scuffs, stood back up only to see Kuma doing the same, though when he looked across the crater and the damage done to the landscape by his attack he saw the metal underneath Kuma's tattered clothing, well that proves that theory. He's definitely like those pacifista things. Naruto crossed his arms and frowned, that was one of my better Rasengan moves. Sage mode helps me keep the form stable around my body instead of just in my hands. It's a good defense and offense, but it takes a ton of power to make the S and when I ram it into stuff it's unstable and explodes. Doesn't hurt me that bad though. And apparently since Kuma was still up and moving it didn't harm him that badly either. Kuma turned to face Naruto but once he turned around his hands were spread wide open, and a mib paw shaped bubble of air many times greater than his own huge body was being compressed into a smaller and smaller form, well the sun is up, and Monkey D. Luffy's crew is still intact. Kuma remarked, it's time to destroy any trace of Mariah's humiliating defeat. He said as he kept pressing the bubble in his hands to condense its size. Naruto let out a gasp. Just a regular blast from Kuma's hands could match a normal Shinra Tensai when it was Naruto's intention to attack with it. If he was condensing that much air pressure then Naruto didn't want to know how much chakra he would have to pump into another to keep this from even touching him. The backlash from a clash between a supercharged Shinra Tensai and whatever Kuma was about to do would this time tear Thriller Bark directly into two pieces and sink it. But his hands were both preoccupied. How fast does he think I am? Naruto wondered as he took a quarter of a second to judge the distance between himself and Kuma. Naruto pulled out a Horatian Kanai and ed his before throwing it across the crater at Kuma. Instead of trying to punch through the bubble and blow up the MIV bomb-like attack prematurely, it bounced off of Kuma's leg just as he ignored the small weapon and was able to compress the paw-shaped bubble to the size of his own hands. As soon as the ping of the metal weapon bouncing off of Kuma's metal leg rang out, Naruto appeared before the weapon could fly too far away from the Shichibukai and wrapped both arms tightly around his leg, gritting his teeth as he willed another sudden teleportation that took them both away, leaving the battlefield silent. One Finger Island, at the very top of the mountain for which the island was named, Naruto and Kuma appeared in a yellow flash, with the latter being swung around violently by the former. Naruto let out a mib yell of exertion and threw Kuma high into the air and formed a Rasengan in his hand that he gripped in his fist, turning his fist blue as he ed his fist back and took aim at the absurdly airborne Kuma who righted himself in the air, his own attack down to its prepared size. Only one swow or this island is toast. Naruto growled to himself with sweat beating down his face, I won't miss. This is my fastest attack jutsu. Senpo. Resentai hope sage art. Spiraling cannon. With the sound echoing out like the crack of a rifle, a fist-sized flash of blue chakra flew from Naruto's punch up to Kuma faster than any naked eye could ever see, and Naruto's Rinnegan eyes could see how unstable the attack in Kuma's hands happened to be, hence why it was his target. 
If Rasankara was a blunt, eyesore of a jutsu meant for rudimentary defense, offense capabilities when it was absolutely needed then Rasentaiho was his only precise technique of his sage mode techniques. Nature chakra helped it keep its shape as it flew. It took fantastic aim since it only went in a straight line and was the size of his closed hand, smaller than a Rasengan. He designed it to fly far faster than even a Rasenshuriken by design, beginning after his fight with Kazaru in Alabasta since that bad guy was extremely fast and troublesome to say the least. As the attack hit home and nailed Kuma's bubble it released a MIV explosion in the air in the shape of a paw print the size of the entirety of the island. It managed to clear out all of the clouds in the sky at the time once the energy was released. Naruto's Rinnegan and Sage Mode faded as he looked up at what would have been Kuma's crippling attack, breathing heavily at using Sage Mode in a battle like that, and my crew complained that I don't train, Fei. Didn't have a reason to until we got on the grand line. His self-mumblings were cut short when the backlash from the explosion in the air reached the lower altitudes in the form of a violent wind that blew him off the top of the mountain and sent Naruto flying into the lake that sat at the foot of the mountain. The giant splash that was created by how hard Naruto's body hit the water attracted the attention of the island's mellow wildlife that came to see what had caused such a thing. They all saw Naruto's body floating towards the shore of the lake, seemingly using his flak jacket as a flotation device so that he didn't have to swim. He spit water into the air as he stared up at the sky, ow, he said before disappearing in a flash. If he had waited for a few more seconds he would have heard a resounding crash in the forest nearby that destroyed a lot of the area. After a minute or two, the sounds of calm thudding footsteps echoed through the wilderness. Thriller barked, stupid Kuma. Naruto grumbled to himself as he walked back to the castle he had been forced to leave due to his battle with the man, well, cyborg he was cursing. He lifted his hand and mumbled out a headcount of how many of the seven Shichibukai he had run into thus far, I've met five of them, his friends had fought three and he had fought two. He had to admit that the sunrise felt good as he came upon the completely ruined courtyard that used to be the main castle and main mast of the ship and wondered what the had happened there until he thought about what it might have taken to put oars down, not even taking into account whatever tricks a Shichibukai like Gekko Mariah would have up his sleeve once that battle was complete. As he came close enough to see better, he saw that Luffy and the other straw hat pirates were surrounded by all sorts of other pirates thanking them for returning their shadows to them. Deciding to head on down to see if his friends were okay and to return the Horatian Kanai to them, Naruto had only one thought after everything that had happened since he had first been called, what does anyone's shadow have to do with any of this? Chapter 35 Dead End Friends Luffy had managed to bring down not only the giant oars, but Gekko Mariah himself. The guy was seriously a tough bad guy. Luffy was 17 and was beating on pirates that had been deemed by others to be unbeatable forces in the ocean. It reminded him of himself and Akatsuki back in the day in a twisted sort of way, although instead of being hunted by the Shichibukai the way Naruto had been Luffy just kept running into them and fighting them out of necessary circumstance. After the battle everyone was quite beaten up, especially Luffy who remained sleeping even when everyone else had managed to get a few winks in after they were treated medically. Naruto himself had some wear and tear from fighting Kuma, but it wasn't anything that he couldn't walk off in a short while. Ever the forager, Naruto let the crew rest and decided to pick through what was left of Mariah's mansion to find something useful to loot before going to see them, there isn't a thing anywhere in this place worth taking. Naruto muttered to himself as he walked outside of the remnants of the building to the ruined courtyard where much of the fight with oars took place. That's because Nami had it cleared out the second she was able to, back when she was with you. Naruto looked off to the side to see Robin sitting serenely at the top of a rubble heap, on a fallen pillar in particular. She was just sitting, seemingly waiting with a small smile on her face. Upon getting Naruto's attention, Robin kept speaking, all of the people that wound up with their shadows returned after Luffy defeated Mariah loaded our ship up with treasure, I don't think there's a scrap left behind. A deadpan look came from Naruto in response, of course she did. Tsunami pulling him aside for a quickie actually had alternative reasoning behind it, to distract him while she had others clean the place out. And there was no way he was going to even be able to lay a hand on any of the treasure if Nami had it. Now he'd never get anything out of showing up there and fighting a Shichibukai. Oh well, he didn't need money. At least his friends were okay. And Nami was more than enough of a prize, are you alright? 
You guys looked exhausted when I showed back up. We're all fine. Zoro was pretty badly hurt, but Luffy's the worst off of us and he'll be fine with some rest. That's what Chopper says anyway. Robin informed him of the current situation since Naruto had been gone for a while wandering around Thriller Bark on his own, but you, how are you doing? Naruto raised an eyebrow in confusion, the fight you had against Kuma, we could feel the force from whatever you were doing from where we were fighting and then you just amble out of the woods looking like you were rolled down a hill. What happened to him anyway? I stranded him on an island in the calm belt. Naruto said with a grin, proud of the method he used to rid himself of Kuma, I don't think he's dead, because what I did wouldn't have defeated me, but he definitely isn't getting out of there anytime soon. Thinking about something in hindsight he rubbed his chin, I hope he isn't the kind of guy that gets mad and destroys stuff. I like that island. Sorry I wasn't any real help though. He finished apologetically. It all worked out in the end anyway did it not? Robin said, her small and calming smile pulling one back onto his face as well, it was good to see you. Did you, see, Nami yet? She asked, hinting at something to him. Naruto blinked at her oldishly wondering why she would ask that. Still though, she seemed to be actually waiting on a legitimate answer. It. Yes, he said, red staining his cheeks. Talking about hooking up with one of his girls with Robin was weird. He still wasn't used to the fact that he was going to try and make that work, you already knew that though, didn't you Robin Chan? She didn't answer. Robin never really talked any more than she needed to in order to get her point across and she was always so calm. It was better than being a motor mouth like him in any case, did you need something? Your can I? Robin said, holding her hand out in an expectant manner, I'd like it back if you wouldn't mind. With a shrug, Naruto fished one of his Horatian kanai from a pocket on his vest connected to his storage space and tossed it over to her so that she could catch it handle first, thank you. Maybe the next time you call me it won't be for something that's so much trouble. Naruto said with a grin on his face before suddenly yelping and holding his backside. He turned around and glared at the ground where an arm had sprouted and quickly disappeared. Turning back to Robin, he gave her a glare because there was no one else that could make random body parts appear to pinch his butt, it, I hate when you do that. Robin let out a small chuckle, you know, you've actually held up quite well for being an antique. She laughed again when she felt the ire in Naruto's stare at more or less being called old again, if only you were several hundred years older I'd probably never let you out of my sight. Naruto simply blinked at her before responding, I don't know whether it's awesome or creepy that you're turned on by old stuff, being that I technically am the old stuff you're talking about. Wait, I just called myself old didn't I? Robin nodded, it, I'm too old for this crap. Traveling around getting into fights is a young man's thing. He said as he stretched and cracked his back. You seem to do just fine to me. Robin said, as she hopped down from her spot on the rubble heap and walked up to him before using a finger to trace his whisker marks, but it has to be tough to get up for such battles in your advanced age. I suppose you deserve a reward. She teased. It's not a problem Robin Chan. Naruto said brightly, and not for the first time since she had met him Robin had to fight the urge to facepalm. Seeing Robin's smile drop was akin to seeing her do just that though, and Naruto laughed at the fact that he had been able to do such to the stoic woman. Eventually Robin just let out a sigh and wrapped her arms around him in a hug, well you've been gone for almost 18 hours from your crew and they have no idea where you went. I'm sure you'll enjoy telling them that you ran off to fight a Mib giant and a Shichibukai without them. He was not looking forward to going back to face that music. Forget meditating to block out the ranting from Nojiko and possibly Bibi, he'd never get the chance to focus with Johnny and Yosaku bothering him for leaving them behind. And Soren wouldn't help, he'd just laugh. So would Miss Valentine, I forgot that I would have to do that, Naruto said dryly before sighing, the longer I wait the worse it's going to be. A nod of understanding came from Robin before she held up the kanai that she had taken back from Naruto to summon him if need be, you still owe me some of your spare time. The next time you come running because of your kanai it won't be to play the hero, I promise. Naruto put his hand over hers on the weapon and gave her a stern look, I'd really rather you called on the Den Den Mushi if you use it again. Random jolts in the back of my head telling me to use Horatian aren't really fun. I'll keep that in mind. Robin said, giving him a small before patting his cheek, now go back to your crew like a good captain and we'll deal with ours. 
Naruto nodded before thinking of something, so you didn't come out here just so we could. There is a time and a place for everything. As she plucked the Horatian Kanai right out of Naruto's grasp, Robin backed away a few steps, we we're about to leave ourselves. Now go. She said, leaving no chance for any dispute. In response Naruto gave her a salute and vanished in a flash right in front of her eyes. Natural disaster, Naruto suddenly appeared in front of his bed and looked around suspiciously before he began to noiselessly skulk towards his own door, wait a minute. This is my ship. Why am I sneaking around my own property? Because he had randomly vanished for almost an entire day and hadn't said anything to any of his crew about it, that was why. Hopefully that Perona girl he yanked from Thriller Bark conveyed the message in his stead. Maybe that could have smoothed things over. Managing to sneak out into the common area and outside onto the deck to see what was going on, Naruto sighed in relief as he could see that the GR surface deck was clear with the exception of Bibi navigating at the helm seemingly without a care. For some reason the whole scene felt like a trap, but the only way to be sure would be to spring said trap. Something told him that he should have just stayed in his room and gotten some sleep before trying to come outside and see how everyone else had fared while he had been gone. But he shoved this to the back of his mind as he walked past Karu and gave the duck a pat on the head as he remained quiet when he walked past. You're in so much trouble. Naruto heard Bibi say in a sing-song voice without her even turning around to face him. So she was used enough to his presence to feel him now was she. Naruto bit back a groan, he had figured as much about being in trouble before he had even shown up back on the ship, on a scale of 1 to 10 how bad would you say it is Bibi Heim? Well, Bibi said in a manner that expressed that she was thinking, judging by the fact that you brought a person onto our ship that tried to take it over, and because of the fact that I'm actually pretty heated at you right now since I had to fight her I'd say you shouldn't try roaming the halls for a while. Looking at Bibi, Naruto raised an eyebrow, especially since she hadn't even bothered turning around to face him since she knew of his presence, you're mad. Wait a minute, you fought. Did you win? He then focused on the most important thing that Bibi had said, Perona tried to take over the ship. What happened to her? Bibi finally turned around with a rather displeased look on her face and her hands on her hips, the girl, Perona, well we wound up giving her the sore and treatment. She finished with a small smile. Naruto's eyes widened and he ran to the front of the ship, looking far over the edge to see Perona submerged halfway in the water and tied to the ship, just like he had done to Sorin months ago, maybe I should snag some sea stone cuffs or something in case this happens again. Hearing his voice, Perona turned her head up and saw Naruto walking down the side of the ship with Chakra, hey, let me out of here. No way, Naruto said, crossing his arms over his chest sternly as he looked down at her, you tried to hurt my crew and take over my ship. Give me one good reason why I should let you go. Perona had been down there for around 12 hours at this point and had been thinking of how to get herself out of this predicament. Sadly her brainstorming had turned up no possible solutions. She thought she could trick someone into somehow letting her go when they fed her they would have had to feed her right, but no one really got close enough to sweet talk into doing so. Polly wound up feeding her by way of his ropes, something that made her glad that she was actually tied up in the water so she could get all of the food that wound up smashing into her washed off quickly enough. But now there was someone there that was close enough to charm into letting her go. And luckily it was the same guy that had taken her away from Thriller Bark in the first place so maybe he would have some sort of emotional incentive to free her. I was just scared and confused, I'm calm now. If you let her go Naruto I'm going to beat her up. Bibi yelled down from the deck in warning as she had still yet to prove that she could defeat Perona. Now that she knew the secret to one of her powers as well, that she had to leave her body to project her spirit elsewhere, she knew she could beat her, you'd better keep her down there. I wasn't going to anyway. Naruto yelled back up to the Alabastan princess, when I did this to Sorin, back before you started staying on this ship, I left him down here for five days before I let him back up, and the only reason I even did it then was because we were going to Whiskey Peak and didn't want to float into a town with some guy tied up in the water. Has she even been down here for a day yet? Bibi shook her head, we tied her down there at dawn. Hearing that, Naruto turned back to Perona, yeah, we're not letting you up yet. Take me back to Thriller Bark and Mariah Sama you idiot. Perona more or less ordered despite the fact that she couldn't do anything to enforce it, if you take me back then how could I mess with your crew again? 
I don't even know where this ship is. That put a grin on Naruto's face. Luffy kicked Mariah's after he got through beating the crap out of that giant oars and we couldn't find Mariah after the battle was over, the Straw Hats think that he left. I couldn't take you back anyway. You can teleport. How can't you take me back? Verona asked, anger creeping more into her voice. You brought me here in the first place didn't you? Naruto scratched his scalp and frowned. I wasn't even supposed to be there. And I took you away because you were scared of oars. I can only teleport to certain beacons and that beacon that I'm talking about probably isn't at Thriller Bark anymore. Besides, his stern look returned, I didn't help you just so you could try to attack my crew. So you're staying down here. You can't do that to me. Verona shouted before a wave crashed high enough to fill her mouth with seawater, forcing her to sputter and spit, I'm a girl. Naruto pointed up at Vivi who was waving down, so. She's a girl too, and I beat her up all of the time to teach her how to fight better. He then made an about face and started walking back up the side of the ship. I'm going to leave you here until you chill out and you realize just how bad you messed up by trying to take out my crew. Verona tried to wriggle out of the tight ropes holding her there. Polly could tie a mean knot with those ropes of his, who are you people anyway? She asked. He apparently teleported back to Thriller Bark to fight Oars and he came back in one piece. So how strong was this person? You don't even know who we are and you attacked us. Naruto questioned as Vivi giggled up on the deck at the girl's information or lack thereof, fine. I'm Uzumaki Naruto and you just lost to the Foxhound Pirates. Someone will feed you later. That's the guy that almost joined the Shichibukai. That means he's around Mariah Sama's level of strength. Verona thought before Naruto disappeared over the railing back to the deck, wait. You can't leave me here. I'll drown. Vivi chimed in instead of Naruto in this instance, no you won't. You're high enough so that you'll be fine. The only way you'll drown is if the ship randomly starts to sink. For some reason hearing the girl say that didn't make Perona feel any better as another wave hit her in the face. A few hours later that evening, a very good way to avoid any negative repercussions from just disappearing on the girls that like you is to tell them that you left to help out the crew that was comprised partially of one of said girl's sister. Another way was to play the sympathy card and try to get some credit for going out and going up against a Shichibukai in the process. Oh my big heroic captain. Miss Valentine said proudly with a huge smile on her face, sitting in Naruto's lap in the common area along with the rest of the crew, taking on all of the big, bad pirates in the world without flinching. She playfully ran her fingers through his hair, and he was just fine with that. Nurit shrugged from a seat near Funkfree, at least I didn't have to patch anyone up this time. She said brightly. The workload on the natural disaster ranged from totally slow and boring to completely frantic and intense. At least no one brought anything stupid to her to fix like anyone on Bellamy's crew would. Yeah, everyone on this ship was tough enough to ride out their own hangovers without bugging her to fix them up. Get off of Naruto already. We're supposed to be mad at him Valentine. Nojiko said before suddenly changing gears, oh, but thank you for helping Nami, I really appreciated Naruto-kun. Her sweet tone then turned to another one of an admonishing nature, but you can't just leave the ship to go off into a fight like that, what if you died? And you brought that girl back here without even knowing what she was like, once again Nojiko abruptly changed moods to one of an understanding and sweet nature, but you didn't know she'd try to take over the ship, and you were just trying to help someone that needed it. She then turned somewhat angry again and let out an exasperated groan, you and your stupid hero complex. Crazy, Soren muttered to himself lowly only for a gunswow to ring out and fly past his head, embedding itself into the wall, you were trying to miss on purpose weren't you? He asked with some ire in his voice. The gunswow made him activate Tekai out of instinct and the bullet wouldn't have defeated him, maybe. But that wasn't the point. I am not crazy, I just care too much. Nojiko defended, her pistol still smoking from the swow she had just taken, someone has too. Polly had been leaning on the wall near the door and the open window out to the deck so that he could smoke a cigar inside while listening to what had called Naruto away so suddenly, you ever think that you're going to get a little too famous Uzumaki? He said as he exhaled smoke out of the window, I know pirates get into fights all of the time and everything, but you're like a magnet for messed up stuff. Naruto shook his head, how? The only thing I'm really famous for that anyone even knows about is, kidnapping, Vivi Heim, 
defeating that Nazumi guy back in the East Blue, and ripping up a lot of the buster call back at Eni's lobby. A lot of people don't even know about the really tough people I've fought like Aokiji or any of the Shichibukai. No one talks about that. He didn't really care too much about that though. Making waves was good and everything so that when he started talking people would listen, but to just be known as the guy that causes anarchy everywhere he goes wasn't what he wanted, and it wouldn't help him if he was really serious about trying to change the world, by the way I'm still not a pirate. From the kitchen, Johnny and Yosaku were raiding the fridge while Miss Valentine was busy fawning over Naruto, taking advantage of their opening to do so, you said that last thing like it wasn't a big deal Naruto and Iki. Yosaku said in a grumble as he and Johnny both made a MIV sandwich with the works that they were prepared to cut in half once it was done. Johnny cut the sandwich and Yosaku reached for one of the halves only to jump back when Johnny slashed at him with his sword, what the? Like you're getting the bigger half. Johnny said, resheading his sword and holding his hand on the hilt as if he would attack again, the cutter gets the choice on which sandwich they get. Yosaku took Kibikirabaucho off of his back and held it, also ready to fight over the sandwich, what kind of crappy reasoning is that? You're just going to take the bigger half. I cut it evenly. Johnny fired back in response, his fingertips drumming on the handle of the sword. Then what are we fighting about it? Yosaku said as he moved for the sandwich only to use his sword to block Johnny's incoming attack. Johnny pushed against his friend and current opponent's oversized sword in vain as he tried to reach for his choice of sandwich, it's the principle of the matter. Oi. Naruto snapped, shifting the very happy Miss Valentine around in his lap, take that outside. You're not messing the interior up over something this stupid. Both Johnny and Yosaku kept their swords in clashing position and slowly walked their way out of the kitchen through the common area, and out through the front door, even though they had to sort of duck so that Yosaku could fit Kubikirabacho out without destroying anything. Vivi was on her way back inside when they were doing this though, and looked at them curiously before shrugging it off and walking in. Once there, Vivi looked around and saw the very large sandwich in the kitchen as her stomach let out a growl, does that belong to anyone? She asked with a famished look on her face, not seeing anyone seemingly care about the rather delicious looking foodstuff. Everyone in the room looked at each other before unanimously shrugging and shaking their heads, can I have it? I haven't eaten all day. Manning the wheel in the captain's stead took precedence over being fed apparently. Once again, everyone just shrugged before nodding altogether, putting a bright smile on the princess as she more or less skipped into the kitchen to grab the sandwich. As the sounds of rather intense sword fighting commenced outside, everyone else inside just basked in the mostly tranquil silence. No one really seemed to mind as Vivi happily ate the sandwich that was more or less the source of the conflict. Nurit wasn't too pleased though as she could see some of the flashes of sparks from the swords in the dark, I'll probably have to stitch them both back up after that's over. Three days later even though it was supposed to be daytime, the sun was not visible. Everyone thought it was very weird because they knew that enough time had ped for the sun to rise, and there wasn't a cloud in the sky so it wasn't that there was a storm in the vicinity. It was just merely dark outside as if it was nighttime. It had been like this for a few days at this point and everyone was having a bit of trouble coping with the unwelcome and sudden change. From the helm, Naruto rubbed his eyes while nearby Polly let out a lazy yawn. Man, this no sunlight thing is really messing with my internal clock. I can see why most of the people that stopped in at Water 7 would complain about the Grand Line because this is seriously messed up. I know what you mean. Naruto said, empathizing with Polly's less than energetic outlook on the day, I think it's this place. This whole area is just making me feel tired. Me. And I'm never tired. Is having no sun really that bad for you? I don't know. Polly said, why don't we ask someone that would know? He turned his head up to the crow's nest and yelled, hey Soren. Does not having sunlight on you for a long time make you tired? How the would I know? Asked Murat, I'm not a doctor. Polly then realized that asking Murat probably would have been more productive. Oh, well we just you med that since you've been locked up you would know or not. He yelled back up so that Soren could hear him. I've never been locked up in prison you idiot. What made you think I've ever been to prison? Your tattoos that you've got over most of the left side of your face and body look legit. Polly said, I thought that was prison ink. Those are to cover up the scars that Doflamingo gave me. I didn't know that. Stop yelling at me. You yelled first dumb. 
I'm not going to climb down so we can talk in even toned voices, so deal with it. The door to the inside of the ship then slammed open as Murat stepped out with signs of sleep in her eyes, will you all please shut the up? Everyone inside is trying to sleep. And I don't like getting woken up listening to something so stupid. She yelled, actually getting the more powerful men to stare at her before nodding dumbly. Question. Polly said weakly, getting a glare from Murat who wished she could just go inside and get back to bed, is it bad for you to not get any sun? Like does it take your energy away? Because we are all tired for some reason, and we don't know why. Murat sighed and rubbed her temple before answering. It was a fair enough question and it was supposed to be her area of expertise so why not do what he job instructed her to do? Handle any and all medical matters, including information for preventative purposes, actually yeah, it's kind of really bad to not get any sunlight. Sunlight actually converts a form of cholesterol in your body to vitamin D, it also helps you fight off skin diseases and can help your immune system. Sunlight also helps you sleep better at night and it helps produce serotonin and endorphins that make you feel better and keep you in a better mood. Naruto nodded sagely as he took all of this in. Ah, so that's why everyone's been so pissy for half of the week. Vivi and Nojiko almost got to fighting yesterday, that was weird. Nojiko was usually very level-headed and responsible most of the time, and Vivi was such a complete and total sweetheart that she didn't fight unless someone forced her to. Not yesterday, it was a catfight of the highest order. Polly grinned to himself remembering the incident fondly in his own mind as he, along with Soren and Johnny, did nothing to break the two women up, opting to sit back and watch Rapley instead, I've never seen Vivi mouth back like that when someone told her to take the helm before. Then again, Nojiko did demand her to in a pretty wide way, those two inappropriate women. He said, trying to act as if he didn't enjoy watching it. What I don't get is why they didn't break out the weapons until after me and Johnny had separated them. Naruto said, remembering how when he had physically lifted up Vivi to carry her outside and away from Nojiko who was being carried further into the ship towards her room by Johnny, both girls had pulled out their respective tools of combat. Over two dozen clones met their end by Vivi's hand, and Johnny wound up getting lumps on his head from being hit with Nojiko's pistol when both men tried to calm the women down. Good thing he wore that headgear or it could have been worse. And on that note I'm going back to bed. Murat said, letting out a yawn as she walked back inside the ship, keep it down, and don't call me unless your gut swow. Will do. Polly said evenly as he lit a cigar for leisurely purposes, hey Soren, have you ever been this far ahead on the Grand Line? The only other person in the party that might have been that far before would possibly have been Miss Valentine back when she had been amming funds and things of that like for Baroque works, but she wasn't there at the moment. Soren looked out on the horizon from his vantage point through binoculars as he heard the shipwright ask him his question, not this far, that's for sure. I never really went any further than Jaya back when I was wandering between the islands looking for bounties. Naruto leaned against the steering wheel and set his chin against it as he stared out ahead of him on the darkened waters, so none of us know what to expect when we head out further from here. Pretty much. Soren said before scouting something through his binoculars, Yo, Uzumaki, we've got land coming up. You going to untie Perona from the front of the ship? She's been quieter than I was when you tied me to the front of the ship. That's because I bantered with you on purpose. Naruto said in response. Soren and he had a much better verbal back and forth than he and Perona did. All Perona did whenever he went down there was yell at him to let her go, but I guess I should this time too. We can't just roll into port with a girl tied up to our ship. That would send the wrong message to anyone that saw them. Finally, hearing Perona's voice, Naruto locked the wheel and jumped over the railing, planting his feet firmly in his usual gravity-defying show as he looked down at Perona, if I let you up you'd better behave. No attacking any of my crew or anyone else, and if you run away I'll find you. Since you can't break Polly's ropes he's going to be the main one watching you. Hey. Polly yelled over the side of the ship at Naruto, why do I have to watch her? Naruto turned towards him and gave him a deadpan look, because you're new, and all we make you do otherwise is make sure everything on the ship is up and running. Now you double as the ship warden in case we capture people. Polly's jaw dropped as Soren cackled in amusement from the crow's nest, ship warden. Since when? Since I just thought of it. Naruto said, tapping his head as if he were brilliant. 
everyone else has a job title on this ship so why not you too? I was already the shipwright you idiot. That was my job. Polly shouted, prepared to instigate a fight at this point. How can someone so stupid live for so long in the first place, let alone on the Grand Line? And he was planning on traveling even further still. Naruto rolled his eyes as he started cutting Perona loose. He had to channel wind chakra to the blade of his kunai to get through the rope though. Why did Polly have ropes that thick? It was ridiculous, both of those jobs are barely jobs. The only time the shipwright thing will come in handy is when something gets messed up. And how often do you think we're going to actually capture anyone? Soren grumbled upon hearing that, you captured me, you maniacs always mess things up on this ship. Polly argued again, do you think the place always looks so good because you're careful owners? No. You guys cause more damage to this thing than a little bit. I've had to repair the outside of one of the masts like five times since you recruited me. I'm not even going to go into detail on all of the stuff you destroy inside of the ship. He still remembered when he had to fix the hole in the ceiling of Naruto's room after his short battle with Boa Han since she had kicked him through it. Naruto jumped back over the edge of the railing, holding onto Perona before letting the rather thoroughly drenched girl try to stand on her own, Holly stopped yelling. Naruto hissed quietly, there are four very tired girls inside that'll try to kick our ass if you wake them up. Now go do your job and take Perona inside to go get dry. He took some satisfaction in seeing Polly gnash his teeth at the insistence of his, new job. Perona looked back at Naruto, I want to go back to Thriller Bark. She said, feeling some kind of form of homesickness surrounded by the strange people. If what she had learned about Uzumaki Naruto from what was reported on him was true then she was lucky he hadn't had her defeated yet. He was reportedly very brutal. Yet he seemed like more of a reasonable person than what the bounty reports on him said. If he really was as bad as he had been reported to be then he would have defeated her or worse once he learned that she had attempted to take over his ship. His crew didn't seem to acquiesce to his every command either since Polly was willing to engage in a total argument with him and the doctor girl Murat was willing to yell at him and the others quite brazenly. The Vivi girl was apparently willing to attack him because she was cranky if what she heard on the deck last night was any indication of the ship dynamic. It was something of a madhouse here. I can't take you back. Naruto said apologetically, I don't know where it is, and even if I did there isn't anyone there anymore. I told you, Yeko Mariya somehow left under everyone's nose. I couldn't tell you how to find him now but his signature isn't anywhere near Thriller Bark. Perona's face told the whole story of her complete and utter dislike of the current situation, so I'm stuck as your prisoner forever. She asked weakly, rather out of character to the way that she had been the other day, oh it, now I'm their slave. This couldn't possibly get any worse. She didn't know if it was the gravity of the situation setting in, or the fact that she hadn't stood up properly in over three days, but Perona's legs gave out on her at that moment as she fell to her knees on the deck. Naruto squinted his eyes seeming to be wrestling with himself in heavy thought over something at the moment before he chose to speak again, I wouldn't say that you're stuck with me forever. I mean, you and Mariah technically weren't my enemies and I didn't really fight either of you head on. We did. Soren and Polly said simultaneously with tick marks on their heads at seemingly being overlooked in the deliberation process. Either way, Naruto continued as that also fell into his train of thought over how to handle this, in the end that was my fault too that you wound up here in the first place so I'm responsible for that. I guess if you don't try to do anything stupid to us you can stay here until you find some way to find Gekko Mariah again. Verona just stared up at Naruto who looked as if he had settled on taking the correct course of action, you would do that. What kind of pirate are you? He's not a pirate. Soren and Polly said simultaneously, this time in deadpan voices as Naruto grinned and nodded due to his crew's compliance with not calling him a pirate. Though Naruto soon let his grin fade so that he could speak to the extremely mistrusting Perona. He couldn't exactly blame her for not trusting him though, if you don't want to then I can just drop you at Constellation Island once we get there. Soren says he can see land on the horizon, and that's where we were headed anyway. Now no one was sure if it was the fact that she was in a bad mood due to the being stuck in the water for half of the week, or if her ire was raised at the thought of being just dropped aside once they reached another settlement, but Perona bristled at that option, so you think you can just drop me because this whole thing isn't your problem huh? 
She pointed at Naruto accusingly as she got her legs back under her and stood up. Dream on. You're stuck with me until I find Mariah Sama again, and you owe me new clothes too. With that, she marched inside with Polly on her heels to make sure nothing funny went down while she was inside. Naruto just blinked in confusion wondering what the had just happened, and Soren stood in abject shock before he voiced his thoughts, wait a minute, she can leave. He said incredulously, you didn't give me the chance to leave. You pretty much forced me to join. Hearing his first mate's complaints, Naruto turned up to the crow's nest to argue back, where else did you have to go other than prison or an early grave? And don't act like you hate being on this ship, you know you love it. That's not the point. Hours later Constellation Island, upon getting in clear sight of the island, the crew members that were already up and about took it upon themselves to wake all of the others up prior to making port to wait for the log pose to reset. Thus the rather groggy foxhound pirate crew took in the sight of their destination. Just like the entire area that they had apparently sailed into the island seemed to be always nighttime. The large island seemed to be based upon a rather large and shimmering meteor sticking up out of a crater like a MIV hill formed in the actual landom of the island that was miles in size, as if it was supposed to be there, the only difference being the black mineral of the meteor not matching the regular looking earth of the real part of the island. The outskirts of the island close to the ocean had trees and homes where there weren't areas for ships to dock, but there weren't very many homes that far out from the center of the island on the large meteor, the place where the actual hustle and bustle of the island took place. On the meteor itself, there were many more homes built into the side of it and there were very large holes set into it where people could apparently enter the space rock itself. In addition to that, there were also a row of very large telescopes that could be seen from seaside. As they looked into the air above the island they could all see where the island took its namesake from. Directly above the island the heavenly bodies that most people would have to focus to see on only the clearest of nights elsewhere in the world were clearly visible and easily distinguishable. It seemed like there were more stars than black sky to look at. Planets were even visible, they swore they could see every little ripple of gases that floated through the universe from their position. As they managed to dock their ship and walk around, Naruto left a multitude of clones to keep watch over it in their absence along with Karu who just wanted to keep sleeping. This left everyone free to see the island firsthand instead of having someone left behind to keep guard. It's so pretty here. Nojiko said with a smile on her face as the crew wandered through a beaten and paved path through the forests that surrounded the outsides of the island. Chirping crickets, hooting owls, and all sorts of nocturnal creatures were abound. I don't think I mind staying here until the log pose resets at all. Johnny cracked his neck and rolled his shoulders out as a manner of stretching, I don't know about you guys but I'm still kind of sluggish. I could head on back to the ship to catch some more Z's right now. Multicolored fireflies were all over the place, seemingly lighting their way more easily than any human built lamps could. As they kept walking they eventually came along a rather large lake with tall reeds around it, and one man hanging out by the side of it just sleeping. Naruto jogged up to the man and stopped nearby him, hey excuse me, can you tell us anything about this island? We're not really from around here. His question was not met with an answer, just a snore that put frowns on everyone's faces, oh. Still no answer. Let me try. Miss Valentine said as she walked over to the sleeping man and kneeled down by his prone form, it would be really helpful if you could help us out sweetie. She said pleasantly with her usual lovely smile on her face, only to get a snore in response that caused the smile to fade, really. Soren let out an impatient growl and walked over as Miss Valentine stood back up, wake thee up. Soren yelled as he kicked the man on the ground hard enough to jar him from his sleep. As the man sat up and glared at him, Soren turned back to the others, there you go. That's what you call taking command of the situation. Verona looked at Soren and leaned over to the person closest in age to her, Bibi, ironically also the person that she had something of a bone to pick with. But she couldn't really fight Bibi due to the entire crew being there and knowing how to defeat her now, he's really kind of, violent, isn't he? Well, only to the people that he doesn't know. Bibi said matter-of-factly before turning her eyes to Perona, I still don't like you, just so you know. The feeling is mutual princess. Perona jabbed back. That almost caused Bibi to blurt out the question of how Perona knew she was a princess, but Nojiko's gaze when she was about to told her to keep it quiet. It was just a general and rather spiteful nickname, not an address of her official title. 
The sleeping man rubbed his eyes and looked up at the foxhound pirates with half-lidded eyes, what do you all want? Can't you see that I'm trying to get my daily 18 hours of sleep in? He seemed more upset that he was awake instead of the fact that he had been kicked. Troublesome foreigners, no one else on Constellation Island is getting kicked awake right now. At that moment, Naruto had the ultimate flashback to his old friend with a pineapple-styled ponytail that acted a lot like this man did, what's the pastime around here on the island? It's a really big place. What do you guys do for fun? This. The man said in a flat tone of voice, we sleep, and we just spend time looking at the stars and planets that pee overhead. Hearing that, Naruto muttered something akin to, an island full of shikamaras in an incredulous manner, though no one got the reference other than him, if you guys woke me up just to ask a stupid question like that then I'm going to be pissed. We just wanted to know something about the island. Nurit asked from her spot riding atop Funkfried in his elephant form, we've never been here before and we don't know anyone that's ever been this far on the Grand Line. A smirk crossed her face, my last captain was kind of a coward that played it up like he was a big swow. He never really went very far at all. The man looked at the crew inside as he guessed the fastest way to get rid of them would be to tell them what they wanted, Constellation Island gets a sunrise only once a year, and this isn't anywhere near that time. We get the name of the island from the clear view of space we can get from here. The meteor in the island landed here hundreds of years ago, apparently it punched a hole right through the sky that never really went back to normal for some reason, that's why we can even see the stars so clearly in the first place. He lay himself back down and tried to go back to sleep after he was done talking. What does this island have? Yosaku asked, getting a tick mark out of the lazy man for keeping him from going back to sleep, it's huge. The man cracked an eye with a slight glare, my friends, you are looking at the end of paradise. You could see the red line out on the horizon from here if there was any sunlight, it's actually a beautiful sight when the sun comes up, there's a big festival for it and everything. He shifted in place to get comfortable before continuing, but, because we're so close to the red line that means we're close to the Sabayati archipelago, luckily we have a pretty bad representative with the slavers since we have low energy and are pretty useless with any real work. Slavers. Naruto said with surprise in his eyes upon hearing of them. He then remembered how Boa Han had shouted at him with great conviction about how she would not allow herself to be taken as a slave by him, despite the fact that he had been confused at the time, so they really do still have slaves, he could feel his blood boiling at the thought of it. If it was that well known that such a thing happened in this region of the Grand Line then why didn't anyone stop it directly? Not knowing of Naruto's growing anger over the last thing he spoke of, the informative man continued speaking on, they don't come around here trying to pull us away for that crap. World nobles don't come here very often either thank god, but we do get some very well-to-do tourists here. They hang out inside of the meteor mostly though. That's the place with all of the casinos, nightclubs, shops, wowls, all of that stuff. Hey, the place had to make that tourist money somehow, right? Then that's where we're going I guess. Nojiko said with a shrug as she smiled gratefully at the island local, thanks for the help. Yeah whatever. The man said as he fully shut his eyes once more and turned over to face away from the group of travelers, now leave me alone so I can catch back up with my sleep, my shift is in 12 hours. Lazy, everyone thought all together as they headed off towards the direction of the meteor that apparently housed all of the interesting things that Constellation Island had to offer. Constellation Island Meteor Interior. Surrounding the meteor itself in the space between the edge of the crater and the meteor there was running water, making an active moat surrounding the space rock. The water ran in and out of holes carved into the meteor that people used boats to travel with. A large drawbridge allowed the crew entrance to the interior where they took in the sights there as well. It was the size of a regular city. A mostly wide open cave setting with stores built into the walls of the meteor and also built traditionally with standard building materials. There was natural light in the cave by way of crystals built into the meteor that allowed people to easily see. There were multiple paths and spirals where buildings and recreational areas were elevated for a better view. In the center of the meteor was a large lake and directly above it there was an opening to the outside where people could see through to the sky as if they were outside. Waterways ran through the interior with citizens using boats to traverse the waters instead of using the paths and bridges built to walk. 
it seemed to go along with the running theme of the people on the island of not having energy as most would just let the waterways carry them since they would inevitably get to their destination, just not on time. It was weird that such a lazy group of people would have their shops open 24-7. Nojiko and Miss Valentine pretty much dragged Perona off to get her the clothes that she said Naruto owed her, both women understanding why she felt that way what with being stuck in the water for three days, despite the fact that they had been the ones to put her there in the first place. With his responsibility and Perona being temporarily taken off of his hands, Polly decided to go and hit the casinos to see if he could double his income he had obtained since joining the crew. Johnny and Soren decided to follow behind in the hopes that the casino had an open bar so that they could laugh at Polly losing all of his money and be inebriated at the same time. Murat went off to see if she could get any more medical supplies, simple stuff like bandages since the crew burned through them. Yosaku then chose to follow his beloved wherever she chose to go, this made Murat want to go find something heavy to make him lug around for continuing to fawn over her. Naruto and Bibi simply chose to walk around the place because the princess wanted to take in the sights of such an exotic place, and because Naruto wanted some thinking time as he was still pretty heated over hearing about Sabayati Archipelago and the slave trade circulating from there. Eventually this led to Naruto leaning against a wall of the meteor, thinking to himself as Bibi used one of the telescopes provided for public use to get an even better look at the stars and other things, this island is so beautiful. You hear about places like this existing on the Grand Line, but hearing about them and actually visiting these places is something else altogether. Taking a second to stop thinking so seriously, Naruto looked over at Bibi and how excited she was to just be in a new place like Constellation Island. She was usually like that most places she went since she had started traveling with them. While everyone seemed to find something to like about the locations they traveled to, it wasn't very hard for Bibi to do so at all, she was always so enthusiastic. She's going to be a really great leader when she winds up taking over in Alabasta. Naruto thought to himself with a smile, Bibi's a good girl and she's smart. She also cares a little too much, but that's not really a bad thing if she's going to rule a nation. She definitely had the empathy part of being a benevolent ruler down. The first princess he met had to have that more or less beaten into her head. Bibi took her eyes away from the telescope to look curiously at the blonde shinobi that ran her ship of current residence. She returned the smile he was giving her with a very warm one of her own, are you feeling better now Naruto? She asked him, what made you think I was feeling bad? Naruto replied, trying to keep up his smile as a front. The leader could never be seen stressing out or it would trickle down to his subordinates. I saw your face when that man talked about the slavers. Bibi frowned as she explained, I've been to Marijoy before with my father, I've seen what the world nobles do with those people. They aren't even humans as far as the nobles are concerned. Father couldn't rationalize it for me and he didn't even try. You're a good person, so I can only imagine how you feel about it. Naruto let out a grunt of aggravation as he leaned out the opening and stared out at the great view presented from their location, why the would anyone ever let something like that happen? What's the point? Is it too much to ask that people know how to act on what's right and wrong? It's the way things are I'm afraid. Bibi said distastefully, leaning the same way Naruto was as she looked out next to him, the world government values the status quo over what you and I see as common decency. World nobles can do anything they want, anything at all. Just because their ancestors formed the world government 800 years ago. They don't even do anything to run the government at all. Naruto could hear the venom in her voice as she spoke of them, he had never heard Bibi speak of anyone like that before, do you hate them Bibi Heim? No, Bibi said, shaking her head, I hate the fact that they have all of that power and influence for nothing. They can do anything, and yet they use their status to bully others and hurt how great they think they are. She let out a sigh, leaders aren't supposed to be like that. They should be something to look up to. But the world nobles are just terrible people. Hating them won't do any good though. It wouldn't change anything. A nod came from Naruto before he asked her another question, do you ever just want to turn back around and go home to Alabasta? He asked, getting Bibi to turn her head towards him in shock, I love having you on the crew, everyone does actually. It's really going to when you can finally go home safely, we're really going to miss you. Bibi's look of shock morphed back into a smile, you're saying that like it's going to happen anytime soon. I don't think I'm going home for a while. 
She let out a wistful sigh as she continued, Sometimes I do wish I could go home, but I love this crew, it's actually really fun to be here. You've made me so much stronger too so I can really defend my people the next time they need me. I really appreciate it all. You soak up everything I've taught you like a sponge. Naruto said with a laugh, you're really easy to teach. Besides, we love having you with us. Even when you do wind up going home you're still one of us, and if you ever need us we'll be there in a heartbeat princess. Vivi took that moment to let out a laugh as well, so you'll be my honorary knight. If that's what you want to call it, yeah. A grin crossed Naruto's face as he replied, I'm your knight Vivi Heim, and if there's anything you can't handle I'll always have your back. He bowed to her with a flourish, getting a playful knock on his head from Vivi who was stuck in full-on laughter at this point, that's a promise though. I already made the promise that I won't ever disappear from your lives, I meant it. We'd all just find you anyway. Vivi said slyly, though she was turned away slightly so he couldn't see the blush on her face at his insistence of being her knight, ha. Huh? Agaram, Pell, and Chaka would have heart attacks if I somehow convinced Naruto to be a knight or something. I'm starting to think that's true because I keep hearing people say it. Naruto said with a sheepish look on his face as he rubbed the back of his neck. Constellation Island exterior of the meteor. Sir. Ma'am. A marine said as he ran up to Hina and Smoker, witnesses have recounted seeing people fitting the description of Uzumaki Naruto's crew members within the meteor structure of the island. Hina chuckled and leaned against Smoker's nearby motorbike, Hina told you that coming around the backside of the island was a better idea. You see, when you attack head on you get your ships destroyed. A little misdirection works wonders. I thought I told you to shut up about that. Smoker replied rather tersely. He didn't need to be reminded of how the natural disaster literally smashed through his blockade with very little effort needed to do so. How rude Smoker Kuhn. Hina said with a smirk as she pulled her dark brown gloves tightly on her hands, Hina comes all the way to help reinforce you, Hina helps you track down Uzumaki Naruto's trail, and this is how you treat a friend. Promotions really must go to one's head, correct Commodore. Smoker let out a scoff before a small smile broke out on the normally gruff man's face, Hina came here to help herself too. Hina puffed out her cheeks indignantly at Smoker poking fun at her way of speaking, taking down all of these bounty heads would be major for both your and my careers. The only way to be allowed to go to New World is to get promoted, and the only way that's going to happen for someone like me is if I can prove that there's no reason to hold me back by beating strong pirates. Uzumaki beat you up twice Smoker Kun. Hina chimed in as if that were a helpful fact that he had somehow forgotten. He didn't beat me up, he just blew me away both times and ran before I could drift back. Smoker argued back as he sat on the seat of his bike, I know how to fight someone like him now. It won't happen like that again this time. Because this time Hina will fight him with you. The marine captain with long pink hair said confidently as she pretty much shoved Smoker forward and took a seat behind him on the bike, no matter who he is, he can't even touch Hina or else he'll regret it because of Hina's powers. Let's just go already, Smoker said with a grumble, our subordinates are already inside, that means we pretty much have them cornered. With that, he kick-started his bike, powered by his own smoke powers, and drove inside the meteor to attempt to locate the foxhound pirates. Omake. The gauntlet is thrown, a few days after leaving Water 7 on board the natural disaster, the ringing of the Den Den Mushi in the common area quickly beckoned the person that was usually the closest to it when it went off as Naruto jumped basically from the doorway of his own room all the way to the communications animal in one leap, oh. He greeted pleasantly upon picking up the receiver, you've got the foxhound pirates, what do you need? I'm gonna kick your Utai bad guy. Naruto immediately took offense to the quite vulgar greeting. Who spoke to someone like that on the phone? How rude, oh I'd love to see you try prick. You're real tough over the phone so why don't you come find me and say that to my face, Dadbeo. He then blinked when he realized that he had gotten overexcited and that he had fallen back into an old habit, and you didn't hear me say that last part so shut the up about it. As soon as Robin Chan gives me your stupid teleport weapon I will. And then I'll take it and shove it up your, so you can teleport there when I'm done with you. Naruto was about to shout back, fully ready to get into an insult, shouting war with this person until he started piecing things together. Wait a minute, is this Sanji? You're right it is. What the is your problem? Naruto asked him, confused at why the Straw Hat Crew's chef would have a problem with him, 
Just because I said that you were a crappy cook because you couldn't make ramen isn't a good reason to be all pissed off. I said that days ago, I thought we were past it. First of all, I can make ramen, I just choose not to do anything with that Thai food, I'm a gourmet chef. And second of all I'm not pissed because of that, I'm pissed because I've heard of your deflowering our lovely navigator. Wait, you actually can make ramen? Naruto said questioningly before blinking, completely missing what the gist of the conversation was supposed to be about, you son of a. Give Miss Valentine your recipe or I will cut you. Get back on topic. Oh, right. Naruto said, dropping his anger at the whole ramen thing, but he would be revisiting that part of the discussion at a later time, oh. He finally said in realization, that's why you're mad at me. Because me and Nami. Don't you dare say it. I'll never forgive you for taking something so precious away from Nami-san you bad guy. At that moment sounds of a minor scuffle took place as it sounded like the receiver was wrestled away from Sanji, Naruto you jerk. Whatever you took from Nami you'd better give it back right now or I'll kick your. Apparently it was the captain's turn to interject. Luffy. Naruto said, having at this point settled down enough to take a seat on a couch as he continued to talk, what are you talking about? Give what back? Sanji said you took something precious from Nami, like a flower or something, I don't know, I wasn't really listening. All I know is that friends don't take things from friends, so whatever you took give it back. I can't really give back what I took Luffy. Naruto thought to himself with a deadpan look on his face, listen to me Luffy. Whatever he was going to say was cut off as more sounds of fighting over the Den Den Mushi took place before Sanji's voice came back over the line, Luffy shut up. I've got this handled. This is a matter of honor both for myself and my dear Nami-san. So get ready, as soon as I can get Robin Chan to hand over your kunai with my charm I'm going to call you again, and then I'm going to kick your to the moon. I thought I just told you not to call him about something so stupid. Nami's angry voice came through the background before sounds of pain reverberated through the Den Den Mushi. Sanji was probably paying for his rather brazen statement on quite personal matters at the moment, everyone on the ship heard you and knows what you're talking about. One more person picked up the line and spoke to the blonde captain as the sounds of a rather brisk beating echoed in the background, Anaruto, we're going to have to call you back later. Sanji's kind of busy getting, well you can hear it can't you. Usopp said, sounding like a voice of reason before seemingly holding up his receiver in the intended direction so that Naruto could clearly hear what was taking place. Nami-san I was just defending your honor from that villain Naruto. Crash. Who the said I needed my honor defended. And next time, defend me, quieter than that. This is embarrassing. Naruto let out a sigh, normally I'd tell Sanji to bring it on, but for now I think I'll just say good luck to him. Noji Chan's going to call so she can talk to Nami later. Make sure you tell her after she calms down. Got it. Later. See jumping back up to hang up the Den Den Mushi, Naruto then walked back towards his room as if nothing happened, I love my weird friends. Thanks for listening. I hope you guys liked it. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a like for more what ifs and support the author. See you guys in the next video.